December 28, 2010 edition of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm Jay Chapness. I'm acting chairman this evening. And before you panic, I've been on the board for a number of years and have served at, uh, several terms as chairman in the past. Uh, I'd like to start out with a roll call, please, uh, starting to my right. Hi, uh, Tom Kenley. Peter Howe. Peter Black. We do have a quorum of four members uh, present. Would like to point out that the uh, item on the agenda for this evening is an administrative appeal. And for passage of an administrative appeal, we need a simple majority of the members present. Uh, there are four members present, therefore we need three uh, to pass the administrative appeal. I'd like to start out first with old business. Uh, first we'll approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Move we approve the minutes of the September 28th meeting. Seconded. Do we have any comments, questions, clarifications of those? Now your uh, recommendation for approval, all those in favor? Minutes passed. Next item on the agenda is old business, and I do not believe there is any old business. New business for this evening is to hear the administrative appeal of David and Tracy Weatherby at 14 Stonegate Road, tax map U50, lot 24. That appeal to the code enforcement officer's decision to approve an amendment to the Stonegate subdivision and the issuance of a building permit issued on November 1st, 2010 for a dwelling at 6 Stonegate Road, which is tax map U31, lot 9D. I'd like to call first on Mr. Smith to uh, present a bit of background information on this item. Good evening. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Patricia Dunn, who's representing me on behalf of the town. Okay. Um, and she's going to give an overview of, of where we're at. What I'd like to do, everybody who approaches the podium this evening, if you would state your name, your address, and your relevant position for attending the meeting tonight. Yes, my name is uh, Patricia Dunn. I'm an attorney with uh, Jensen Baird, Gardner & Henry in Portland, and I'm here tonight um, representing the code enforcement officer in this um, administrative appeal. As you stated, this is an appeal um, that was filed um, pursuant to the issuance of a building permit by the code officer for a um, parcel of land uh, that is known as Six Stonegate Road. Uh, there is no um, issue. In, there's no issue on the timeliness of the appeal. Um, it was filed within the requisite 30-day um, uh, period. Uh, the appellants have raised uh, what appear to be several issues. One is a subdivision question um, in terms of whether this property uh, should be subject to subdivision review. And I would just bring to the board's attention. Um, because uh, it has been raised uh, within the last week that uh, perhaps there is a problem with um, the creation of a third lot here, but we are here tonight on the issuance of a building um, permit for one lot. Um, nothing has been requested or issued in terms of a third lot. Um, and so uh, our, our position is that whether there's ultimately going to have to be subdivision review for a possible third lot is not yet an issue and we're only here on the issue of issuing a building permit for uh, one lot um, that was uh, carved out of another piece of property um, on Mitchell Road which abuts um, Stonegate and this lot is frontage on Stonegate Road. So that is essentially the, the issue was the issuance of this building permit and the uh, appeals been filed pursuant to that. Thank you. I would like to, at this point, uh, one board member does have an association with the owner of the property, Mr. Peter Howe, would like to make a statement at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <coughs> I just want to be sure and put it on the record that uh, Mr. Pillsbury is both a neighbor of mine and in fact, as is in his role as a real estate broker, 
Uh, he, he has uh, represented me as a buyer's broker, although we've, he, he, he has never found me a property yet, but <laughs> he does represent me. And so I wanted to be sure that that was, was out in the open uh, in case there was a question of conflict of interest. Uh, I have read the statutory test for conflict of interest, and I have read the case law test for conflict of interest. Uh, and I am convinced that I can, can serve without bias uh, in this matter and that uh, I meet the, the, the criteria for, for no conflict of interest under both of those statutes. Uh, but I did want to bring that up. Uh, Good. Thank, thank, you. thank you, and I'm glad you did. In a small town like Cape, Cape Elizabeth, it's not uncommon for for board members to be associated with uh, people uh, uh, relevant to an agenda item. Uh, and so I personally do not feel that it's a conflict of interest. If there are any people in the audience who would like to make a statement, please do so. Hearing none, we'll proceed. Uh, I'd like to call David or Tracy Weatherby to the podium or their representative to uh, present their administrative appeal, please. Good evening. I'm Hugh Campbell. My family and I reside at 24 Stonegate Road. And Tracy and David have asked me to speak on their behalf since they're out of town on a prior commitment. I'm also here as a property owner in Stonegate, as well as many of the people in the audience. I can ask them to stand now if you'd like to recognize them, or they can speak to the public part of the hearing and state their name and address on the record if you prefer. Do you have a preference? I'm sorry, what? I, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I said that um, there are several neighbors in the audience that support the appeal. And would you like them to stand now to be recognized, or would you like them to read their name and address into the record? So be public? Right. So be right. Yes, you're right. Okay. Thank you. Um, this appeal um, came as a bit of a surprise to the neighborhood. There are many neighbors, many of the neighbors here tonight, that wanted to appeal decision. We decided it was best for the Weatherbys to take the position on appeal because they had all the interests that we had in the matter, and then a few extra because of their location next to the property. I also think we have a unique perspective, a neighborhood perspective, that I think is also supported by the law in this case. And I would agree with the, Mr. Smith's attorney. There are many issues raised here. I'm going to try to clarify them into three issues. Um, we've been in the process during the appeals period to document what had happened through public records and conversations with the town and with the developer and have a pretty good understanding of what we think might have happened. Three issues. The first issue is whether or not an illegal subdivision was created at 370 Mitchell Road, which is the property that borders the Stonegate entrance, the south entrance. The second issue we have is whether the buffer property between the two-acre property and the Stonegate Road is intended to be a buffer for the Stonegate subdivision. And the last issue would be whether the, if it is not intended to be a buffer, whether um, subdivision review is required as amendment to the Stonegate subdivision because the driveways were proposed to come onto Stonegate Road and cut through the buffer. Now speaking to the first issue, whether the lot at 370 Mitchell Road is a legal subdivision. The lot exists, um, as I said, the, the neighborhood perspective, simply put, because there are a lot of documents, a lot of legal arguments to be had. When someone wants to put two pieces of, two houses next to your house and clear the lot, I guess you would expect the town or the neighbor to come to you and say, listen, this is what I'm going to do. What do you have to say? What are your concerns? How can we make this work? And I think that's what the law supports. In this particular case, Mr. Rakonovic, who owned the property, started out as a two-acre property with a single-family residence. 
On September 13th, Mr. Wakanovic cut three deeds to himself. He split this property into approximately a half an acre property with the residents that existed on that property, then two more properties that border the entrance to the subdivision right here, and the buffer right here. So there's a property, property here, which is about a half an acre of subdivision application. Another property borders along here that's about an acre. And there's a site plan um, attached to our appeals papers, which is somewhat fragmented because the town top here could make it wasn't big enough to make an entire copy, so we got three copies, and then when I scanned it in, it became six copies. So, a good just because of the puzzle of the site plan for, for anyone that cares to undertake it. But in essence, we went from a two acre property to two, two properties about a half an acre, and then a third property is about an acre. <laughs> two days after Mr. Wakanovic split this property into three, he deeded it to the developers, and then subsequently, in conjunction with the building permit application here, the three deeds are submitted. Also at the same time, there were uh, driveway permits issued. And one of our neighbors, Mr. Steer, has brought a proceeding before a town council to review that decision. There were similar issues between the both appeals. Um, clearly, the building permit was issued for 6 Stonegate, but all three deeds were submitted, as I understand it, from conversations with the town and review of public records, and that's basically what we've had to go on. Um, the public records, conversations with the towns, conversation with the developer. But the whole buffer has been cleared, and the lot for the acre has been cleared. So I'm not quite sure, and maybe the town can help me on this, that one acre lot, how that was cleared if only a building permit was issued for six stone gate. Um, also, initial indication from the town was the reason that this subdivision review was not required. Typically, under this ordinance in the state statute, when you split one property into three, it triggers subdivision review. The town had told us that there was a residential exemption that was being relied upon to avoid, or in this case, exempt subdivision review. That definition under the law requires that. The, the property, um, one of the lots has to be re retained, or excuse me, there must be a single family residence that has been the subdivider's principal residence for a period of at least five years, immediately preceding the division of properties. In this case, there were three properties that were divided. And again, Mr. Okonovic and the town of Tuttles that they rely upon the primary residential exemption to uh, exempt from subdivision review. During the course of searching public records, we came a letter upon a letter from the town assessor, which appears to have been requested by Mr. Wakonovic, which states that a year before he split the property, he was in fact a resident of Florida. This, we found this letter about a week ago, we submitted it at I hope you have a copy of that in your, in your records. And that simply says, uh, the excerpt, the letter's dated September 24, 2009. And in the middle of it, Mr. Wakonovich brought in evidence that he's a resident of Sarasota, Florida, and requested that I remove the exemption on September 24, 2009. So we have a town document that establishes Mr. Wakonovic's residency in Florida a year prior to the subdivision. And again, the statute requires uninterrupted primary residence at the property, in this case 370 Mitchell Road. So we submit that, that the exemption was not available. This, in fact, was a splitting at the time of the deed um, when it was submitted to town in conjunction with the building permit application. Second argument is that the deed to the buffer property, which is right here, it's a large property, about a half an acre, um, and it, is a tree, it was a tree lot. There's a large stone gate at the entrance. There's a strip of lawn that had existed there and, in fact, was part of the subdivision process, in our opinion. 
Again, going back to the neighborhood perspective, here's a piece of property, a large piece of property that's been created and maintained by the neighborhood with private funds for over two decades, and two driveways are being run through it. And it's been cleared completely, well, almost completely in this process. And we look at the deed. The deed developer gave several deeds to the town during the subdivision process of Stonegate. The north entrance, which is not at issue here, the south entrance, which is it, which is um, some wooded lands, many acres of wooded lands around the neighborhood, the cul-de-sac at the end of Rockcrest, and some other land. In this case, the deed specifically made the grant of the Stonegate Road subject to the coven covenants and restriction of Stonegate, Stonegate neighborhood. And as part of those covenants and restrictions, there's the Stonegate Homeowners Association, which is charged with maintaining that buffer. If you also look to the subdivision law, Subdivision requires buffers to be created at perimeters of subdivisions. And in fact, I would submit that this was exa exactly that, a creation under the ordinance of a buffer to the entrance of Stonegate Road. An entrance which is prob used by the majority of the, the families. There's approximately 65 families in Stonegate. And, uh, you know, conservatively, I think one family would easily go by that entrance a thousand times a year. So it's a very vital, important part of the neighborhood. So which is established we submit under subdivision law of the town, which has a reserved restriction subject to the covenants in the neighborhood, and which finally has been maintained for 20 years by the Stonegate Homeowners Association with private funds. I'm also the treasurer of the Stonegate Homeowners Association for the last three years. We approximately have a budget of ten to $12,000 that we use on all the property buffers and landscaping in the neighborhood. Um, and basically, mow the lawns, fall and spring clean up, prune trees, do some planting, things of that nature to continue the, the buffers and the aesthetics as they appear. Um, the town, yeah, fairly with a, a public road has a right of way. A typical town right of way is much smaller than the parcel at issue. Again, I said it's about a half an acre. Um, I would submit that the town right away to maintain the road is probably about 10 to 15 feet on that actual parcel. And the remainder of the property is the buffer created under subdivision law, um, subject to the covenants in the neighborhood and maintained by the neighborhood, consistent with um, this serving as a buffer for the neighborhood. And lastly, if in fact you do not find that this property was intended for the use and benefit of the 65 families of Stonegate neighborhood and maintained as such um, under, under, that guide, under that directive. We submit that this is a, clearly an amendment to the subdivision of Stonegate. You have two driveways coming out onto Stonegate Road, which was created, in fact, begins and end with, ends with the subdivision. It's a horseshoe that encompasses the subdivision with Road, roads of various roads running off of, of that horseshoe. Um, in the subdivision statute, the amendment has been provided as well, and it clearly addresses changes to public right of way easements. Um, in the roadways. And again, going back to the, you know, the expectations of the neighborhood, we're going to make a big, this is a piece of property you've been maintaining for years. If, if, again, if you don't agree that it was intended to be preserved as a buffer, I mean, I don't see, it wouldn't serve as a buffer if it was temporary. You know, let us know. Let us give you some input and subject to the planning process that the entire neighborhood is subject to. And, and a very successful planning process, I would submit that we have a neighborhood of 65 families with very significant real estate values and tax base. Um, and we're happy and we enjoy the neighborhood. And it's a big reason why we're here tonight. Um, as I said, there's a lot of law, there's a lot of documents. I have more than enough here. Um, I've tried to avoid getting into too much detail, but I'm happy to do that, and we also have other neighbors that have a lot of information and expertise, or are more familiar with some of, some of the arguments and facts, but 
Um, that's basically the overview. The three issues, the subdivision at 370 Mitchell Road, the requirements to maintain the half acre as a buffer, and then if it, the, that it's not determined to be a buffer, that it be subject to the subdivision planning process as an amendment to the Stonegate subdivision. Are there any questions? <clears throat> I have some questions. Um, regarding your first point, uh, the prior owner, Mr. Wabkanish, uh, it's my understanding he's lived there a number of years as that on that property for a long time. Yeah, I believe the deed into him was in 1972. 72. Um, and it was my understanding that he resided or physically maintained furnishing or lived in that property just until prior to the sale. Is that correct? Do you know that? Do you know what that no, is? I just, as I said, initially we, we assumed he lived here. That, that's what we, the understanding we received from the town. Um, we also, our initial argument was that the intent of the statute was not being met because it was clearly he didn't intend to continue to live there, nor did the developer uh, intend to live there. But after that, we found the letter in the assessor's office. And we also talked to the assessor that it's, it seems to state clearly that he was a resident of Sarasota, Florida a year before that. And the statute says uninterrupted for five years. So I don't, the statute doesn't appear to give any credit for length of time. It looks at those five years immediately before that property is divided into three, three parts. And, in, and during that five-year window came that letter which establishes Mr. Lakanovich's residency in Florida. I'm not sure what the residency uh, requirements are for Florida, uh, but for Maine, if he resided in Maine for six months and one day, of this current year, he would be considered a resident of Maine, and we do not know that. And uh, I think that issue could be simply determined by requesting an affidavit from him to state his status of residency for this year, and that uh, that would satisfy that. Uh, but that is that is not the issue for tonight. Is is whether the subdivision is possible. If he, just for clarification, and, and uh, correct me if my understanding is wrong, if he was a resident of that property full time until he subdivided it, then under the laws of the state of Maine, he had a right to split off two additional lots from his property since his first lot, his homestead, we'll call his house, his homestead, is exempt from that requirement and or is not counted. Not counting his homestead, he has the right under the laws of the state of Maine to divide off two additional lots. Not three, but two. Now, it's still undetermined as to whether he satisfies residency. Uh, that should be looked into, in my opinion, and should be determined uh, with an affidavit and file, on file, placed on file, to know whether he is a uh, a resident. That only becomes relevant if he was not a resident for six months, in that the third lot would not be eligible to be created from his. If he did not satisfy the residency, he could only take his one lot, or the purchaser of the property could take one lot and split off an additional lot as long as that lot's conforming. You cannot create a non-conforming lot, but apparently these three proposed lots are all conforming. They all have 100 feet of frontage, uh, and, and they're in excess of those apparently by this plan, which shows they have 117 plus square feet of the two of the lots uh, on a town road. So they meet the frontage requirement. They meet the square footage requirement, so since they are both conforming lots. What we don't know is whether the third larger lot is possible, and that's my understanding, can only be determined 
based on his residency. If he was not considered a resident at the time that he created three lots, then he was only eligible to create two lots. If someone purchased the property and has not owned it or lived there for five years, I should say, they can only create two lots. Uh, so that's not an issue. Now, the issue before us tonight is whether a building permit, that's our one and only issue really tonight, is whether the building permit was, was uh, issued properly. Now, the, 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 the three situations that I see is if, and I'm only addressing your first issue here, the, uh, if he was indeed a resident and he created two additional lots and wanted to build on it, then he has the right to do that, uh, to, to build. He or the subsequent owner has the right to build on those two additional lots. If he was not a resident, the third lot is null and void. He can only divide it into two lots as it stands now without going before the planning board and build on that. The third situation is he, he the owner, the current owner, the new owner, if he, if Love Connish was a resident, then, and that's established, then no planning board is needed. If was Comet, Love Connish was not a resident, as will be determined or should be determined, then only two lots can be made. Either way, a building permit could be issued for this lot. This lot will, will have to be reconfigured if that's determined that he was not a resident. Instead of three, it will become two. But again, that's not the issue. Of the three contingent proposals or that we don't know the answer to, whether he was a resident or not, uh, the building permit appears at this point to be eligible based on your first first argument. Either way, whether he was a resident or whether he was not a resident, uh, uh, this lot in the smaller version or in the larger version if he was not a resident and three lots can't be created, uh, meets the requirements of frontage and size to, to build a dwelling up. Is that, is that clear so far at this point? Yeah, well, I guess my only point of clarification is that the lots were split but I understand that you're looking at the two lots and the third lot, but the, the site plan acknowledges that third lot. I believe all three deeds were submitted with this building permit application. Um, so I guess the issue would be when were the three lots created? And it sounds like you're telling me that at this point, regardless of the three deeds, um, the site plan and the clearing of the both lots and the, and the buffer for the driveway for both lots, that, that third lot hasn't been created? Is that? Uh, we don't know that until residency status of the owner was established. But the, the appeal before the zoning board tonight is whether the building permit was issued in error. And based on the three contingencies that I see, whether he was a resident or whether he was not a resident, the building permit on that lot appears to be valid, valid so far. The third lot is certainly in question whether it can be created and whether a dwelling could be built on it. If the prior owner does not, did not satisfy residency requirements for 2010, then at my first observation of this, that lot number three is possibly not valid. Now, if the prior owner did satisfy, then lot number three is, because he has the right to live in the homestead and spin off two additional lots under Maine state law. Correct me, there are attorneys here. If, if I'm incorrect, please. Okay. Uh, so that's my understanding. Now, regarding the, the, the clearing process, I don't think any permit has been applied for for construction on the third lot, has it? No. Okay. So um, I'm not, that's not our jurisdiction whether site work can begin, which includes clearing on a lot that doesn't have a 
building permit, and, and we're not going to address that tonight. That's not our issue. Uh, that's the first point. The second point um, is regarding the, the, the buffer zone. Now, he, the, the owner, developer, has apparently put in uh, construction drive access uh, to get to the site to start construction on for the lot that's currently being built. And apparently he has for the third lot to do some clearing. Has some clearing been done on the third lot? It, yes, that would appear to be a significant amount of the two acre lot have been cleared for okay. the third lot and also the buffer area as well. In, in, in regards to Stonegate Road, um, I believe most subdivision roads are 20, 22 feet or in that vicinity. Do you know the width of Stonegate Road? I believe it's 30 Road? feet. It, it, it appears to be a nice wide road, but apparently there's another, what, 80 feet or so to the property line? 60, 80, I don't know if anyone knows that. It's 135 feet wide at that Total point. Total width. With 50 foot right away. 50 uh, foot right away? It's about approximately 80 feet from the edge of the road to the property. To the property line. Okay. As, uh, as far as you can tell, has, has vegetation been removed to this point to create the uh, access to the property? I'm not talking about on the property. I'm talking across this buffer area. Yes. The uh, trees or? Yeah, trees, bushes. There, um, Mr. Steer's submission to the town council had some Google map pictures of the, of the buffers that appeared before construction. And they're, they clearly show how much vegetation has been removed. Okay. Um, you know, especially in this season, looks like all of it's been removed. But the, the, there was a selection process with the town uh, director of public works. Um, but the vast majority of this parcel had been stripped of its vegetation. Uh, was the vegetation that was removed by the developer, was that natural vegetation or, or bushes and decorative? For the most part, we, um, speaking as a treasurer, um, I have some knowledge of the landscaping. I pay the bills, but every once in a while when you pay the bills, you get a little more information than you, than you want. But there, I believe some rhododendrons were, were planted. Um, when trees are, are, are destroyed or broken by the weather, they're pruned or removed. Um, so I can't specify exactly um, what additional plantings were done, but there was a strip of grass that had been mowed throughout the season, and there was a significant amount of trees um, and um, grass and uh, bittersweet as well, the good with, with the challenging. Um, and again, that Google map, the Google map view, and we certainly can provide photos of the buffer as it existed. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, the Stonegate subdivision deeded, according to this site plan, shows it as 134 plus feet. Uh, they deeded that to the town, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Did they reserve any buffer for, for decorative purposes or restrictive purposes when that was deeded according to the subdivision covenants or, or master plan? Uh, the, the language from the deed is this covenant is subject to the declarations, covenants, conditions, and restrictions recorded in the registry, which are the Stonegate covenants and restrictions. Um, we're also relying upon the subdivision regulation sec section 16.3-1, um, setting forth the general standards of subdivision design plants or other types of vegetative cover shall be preserved or preserved or placed throughout around the perimeter of any proposed subdivision to provide for an adequate buffer, reduction of noise and lights, separation between the subdivision abutting properties and enhancements of its appearance. But did you find any restrictive covenant? Uh, well, it's, it's subject to the covenants and, and within the covenants there's language which provides for the establishment of the Stonegate Homeowners Association and charges the association with the maintenance of the property. Um, that means, um, and I will find that language shortly.
and it, it is, it's been provided in the affidavit of Rachel Stemineskin um, as well. And I do have that now. The, the Covenants of the Stonegate Association specifically states that they exist for the purpose of protecting the value and desirability of and which shall run with the real property and shall inure to the benefit of each owner thereof. Article 3 of the Declaration states, the association shall be responsible for maintaining, repairing, and replacing stone walls and landscaping within the road right of way, where such maintenance is not the responsibility of the town of Cape Elizabeth. And Article 5 of the Declaration provides that the provisions of Article 3 shall not be amended without the approval of the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. And then I do have the, and as well, the, the actual travel way of Stonegate Ray Road is approximately 30 feet wide at the southern entrance. It's <clears throat> and then, as I said, the, the practice for 20 years under the covenants and restrictions of the Stonegate Homeowners Association has maintained the vegetation throughout the development. I, I, I absolutely see your point. Uh, m many of, of the right-of-ways in, in town, uh, most right subdivision right-of-ways are 50 feet, and, and most roads... Uh, uh, back roads are 20 foot in that area, so the right of way extends 15 feet or thereabouts on either homeowners, and that includes many yards and lawns and, and it's, that city does own, but the city but respects the right of homeowners not to you know to leave their bushes and, and yards and decorative <laughs> and intact. Uh, but there is also if that is city owned and if that is part of the right of way, uh, it's been my experience in the past that people can uh, uh, traverse that for the purpose of putting in a driveway to a approved lot of record. And, and whether or not extensive vegetation was cleared is, uh, again, not up to this board to address. Uh, we're simply trying to identify whether this permit was, building permit was issued. Um, since the lot is accessed from Stonegate and it is accessed from Stonegate Road and the buffer is owned by the town, uh, surface, it, it, from the surface it's apparent to me that they have the right to traverse town land to get to their property. Uh, I, I, that, that's a comment that I have. Uh, if the town does own it, that seems somewhat apparent that that's possible. Whether it's right or wrong for them to remove extensive vegetation is certainly a different issue. Wait, could, I just could respond with two points. One, a typical town right away is not subject to, to covenants of a neighborhood. Um, and as I think we agree, it's much smaller. Um, you know, it makes sense the town needs a right of way to maintain the road, but it doesn't need a right of way this size. I mean, you could argue too that the public road at the Fort Williams is a town right of way, but clearly the, prop the majority of the property that butts out is parkland. And my analogy here is the property that abuts the town right of way is a buffer for the subdivision, and that the subdivision law requires a buffer. So I, I think that's where this buffer comes from, and I think that's where the restrictions on the town um, actions come from. I think, you know, I clearly understand the town's right and, you know, to protect the right of way and their ability to maintain their roads, but I think they can do that within the context. And, as, and if they ultimately wanted to control this buffer, I, I think they would do, they could, as long as it was consistent with the intent of it being a buffer for the neighborhood under the subdivision law and subject the covenants of the neighborhood. The other thing with the covenants, I mean, they provide, and again, going back to subdivision law, they provide standards and a sense of community for the values of the property. So if they're ignored, you know, it affects the integrity of the entire subdivision. Um, again, another distinction as to why the standards and the covenants of the sub subdivision carry the weight that we submit that they do. Uh, <clears throat> any other comments? Yeah, I, I just got a couple questions, um, Mr. Campbell. So exhibit A to the, um, 
Rachel Stamiskin um, st statement. That's the subdivision plan that you, you're relying on? Yes. And it's, I've got a, just a small copy, and I'm not sure I can see everything on there, but is the buffer um, indicated anywhere on there? Does it say or draw or <clears throat> describe the buffer in any way on this plan? <clears throat> I, I would have to defer to another neighbor, John Upton, who is with his family tonight. Um, I certainly can't see it. I even brought glasses, and I don't think they would help. Um, I mean, but... I mean, again, part of the challenge has been there's a lot of information out there. Um, and we're trying, you know, we have a lot, but there's probably some more that we'll see tonight that we haven't seen yet. Um, but uh, um, as I said, the, we've, what we've found so far, and there may be more, are the deed restrictions, are the subdivision law that, re that provide for buffers, and the maintenance of the buffer with private funds for over 20 years. So that's what we found. There may, there may be more, um, and you know, further information could be provided. Perhaps the, sound, the town or the developer has further information on that. But again, I just, I, I, I can del t definitely tell you we did find the restriction in the deed with the covenants, of, you know, subjecting to the covenants in the subdivision law providing for buffers, and you know, the word permanent buffers, and also the maintenance by the association for 20 years or so. Um, and then my other question is, um, I, I drove by there on the way home and I did see what it looks like now. I don't know what it looked like before, but, but what I was wondering is if any um, landscaping or walls, uh, let me just get the language here for a second. I, I want to quote what, what you guys have said. <clears throat> Uh, I'm looking at this Rachel Stimmy's skin uh, deck. You can just say Rachel, that's fine. Rachel, <laughs> Rachel a statement, there. paragraph 5. <clears throat> she mentions the Article 3 of the Declaration. It reserves to the association the right and responsibility to maintain, repair, and replace the landscaping and stone walls within the right-of-way that are not maintained by the town. Do you know if any landscaping or stone walls were removed um, by the the construction project? The, the stone wall is definitely there and the lighting around it. Um, and as part of the landscaping is also allowing the natural vegetation to develop over the years, pruning it where it's necessary, supplement where it's necessary. So and any of that vegetation through nature or through pl planning and um, landscaping um, Um, we have um, a Google map view. I don't know if, if you would all like to look at it. May, may well, we, sure. The problem is with, with we have to, that has to become part of the record. <laughs> <laughs> it, we can't just take it and look <laughs> at it. Would you, would you take I'm, a look? You're probably not willing to part with this, right, and put it into the record. <laughs> so. Would you take a look at this and see if this is somewhat similar to the view, and if so, feel free to enter that in. Is, uh. yep. Okay. No, it's not. Well, let me just follow up then. Um, 
because I wasn't, sh I'm not sure I understand your answer. Were there any cult of it? You, you mentioned a strip of grass that was um, involved in the driveway in the construction project. Project. Were there any other cultivated plants? Well, let me, actually, let me, let me just back up a second, confirm what um, I think you said. Okay. There was no stone wall that was removed? No. Okay. And um, there were no cultivated plants aside from the grass strip that were removed? That you I, know can, I can't. I would um, have to ask someone more. Uh, Maria Hughes is a neighbor who, from the time I've been treasurer, who's been responsible for working with the landscaper. Um, as well as neighborhood volunteers that have undertaken some plantings and, and trimmings. Um, I can't, I can only speculate, and I wouldn't want to do that, but I can uh, investigate that information and, and, and provide it um, after talking to the people that, that have um, you know, performed those duties for the last several years. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess I, I have one more question. And that's in regard to the same issue. Has anybody actually looked at the deed to see whether there were any deed restrictions uh, on the deed granting the right of way? Uh, yeah, the restrictions I would understand are the deed is subject to the covenants of the neighborhood. Right, but nothing written into the deed itself means where you only by normally put restrictions. Only by reference. By reference to the and then, covenants. of course, the subdivision law that provides for buffers as well. Thank you. But on the other hand, there's nothing in the deed that says, I guess, the town can develop. You know that. So, so are you saying that because they're cutting a driveway across the buffer, then the whole parcel of land should have been that they're developing should have been part of the covenant as well? We're saying that Where the did they violate the covenant by putting a driveway across it? By destroying the landscaping and the buffer. The other thing it does, too, if the buffer is stripped, do you have, two, in this application, one house, but potentially two houses that are not subject to the covenant's restriction that the other 65 houses in the neighborhood are? Are as well. So there's the actual physical destruction of the buffer, and then there is the destruction of the uniformity sought to be created by the subdivision. That uh, everyone here tonight from the neighborhood, all houses, um, certain size house, certain size finish, uh, no storage of certain vehicles, I mean, the, the list goes on. Again, that part of the planning process that was sought to be preserved were the, the covenants and the promises that every one of these houses in Stonegate are subject to. So in addition to stripping the vegetation, you also, to a certain extent, strip the covenants of their effectiveness because as you drive by, two houses not subject to the Stonegate covenants restriction. So, and again, I can't think of a more integral part of the neighborhood. I mean, I almost feel like it's a part of our property. You drive by it so much, and it really, I think, has affected the neighborhood um, to see what has happened. Um, so that's, I guess, other harm or injury in this case. I guess I do have a, I have a, I guess I have a comment, Mr. Chairman, if I can. There's, I actually, I actually remember when Stonegate was built, uh, and in fact, walked through the construction uh, quite frequently of many of the houses there. And, I mean, all of those lots were essentially stripped at the time that they were building. Uh, and then the developer went in and, and landscaped the lots as a part of the development process. Uh, but that was, that was all just plain woods. I mean, there were no lots there at the time. Uh, and couldn't this developer do essentially the same exact thing? I mean, to make it fit in with the neighborhood? I think the lots that were stripped were intended to be developed. And they were subject to the covenants and restrictions. This lot was intended to be a buffer. Um, and part of the buffer, I mean, a buffer traditionally serves to protect, you know, you usually see it a lot in industrial situations, commercial. It protects the non industrial from the effects of the, um, of the industry. In this case, to the extent the buffer also preserves the values and the promises for the subdivision. Now, I mean, in effect, it serves as a shield, a buffer. 
So, yes, you, a lot of, all these lots have been cut and developed, but they were building lots. They were consistent with the plan. And again, the, the town helped create this subdivision. I mean, it was thoughtfully planned, and, and, and this is the opposite. This is not being planned. And the thought was, this is a buffer. These 65 lots, 67, but these are building lots. These are the standards you build to. These other areas are buffers or woodlands, what, you know, whatever the plan determined them to be. In this case, they planned for this to be a buffer. So I'd submit it, it's not appropriate to strip it because of the purpose that it was intended to serve. It was intended to serve for the use and benefit of 65 families in that neighborhood and not for the use and benefit of two lots that come, you know, come, coming into the neighborhood. I mean, we ba you basically, we, we don't, what happens to, to that lot? Is it, are we still re required to maintain it? Do we have to go to the planning board to amend it so we're not responsible for it? I mean, it essentially becomes the front yards, the way I see it, of, of the properties. So, the, the, again, from the neighborhood's perspective, it, it doesn't make sense because of the intent that property was to serve and what will happen if that's destroyed, both to the physical aspects of the property and also the, the covenants and restrictions that uh, provide uniformity and value to the neighborhood. Mr. Campbell, I have a, another question. I was just thinking about um, what you said before and sort of the issue here. If, if, he, if this developer had made the driveway go out to Mitchell Road instead of going to Stonegate Road so that it avoided the buffer, would would you all have a problem with the building permit at all? I mean, it seems to me that then, then I, I wouldn't. And and so then isn't isn't because what was presented to the building, uh, the code enforcement officer was a approved driveway permit that he had to rely on. I mean, he doesn't have jurisdiction over the the driveway permit. So isn't this a driveway issue, not a building permit issue? Because I, I mean, you're not contending that. In other words, he, he was presented with, I mean, yep. with a valid um, driveway permit when the developer applied for the building permit. And so, you know, he doesn't have to second guess the, the driveway. He just has to see whether, um, whether the, the building, um, per, the application is proper. So is it, I mean, isn't really your issue with the placement of the driveway? Isn't that what you need to challenge, the, uh, is, is well, the, this, the driveway application? Fortunately, Mr. Steer is here, and I was at the hearing for, for the town council, and I, I do agree. There, this is a little messy. There's two proceedings. A lot has happened. Um, my recollection is that what I heard at that meeting is there was a reliance on the building inspector from the Public Works Department. I, I may have that mistaken, but, again, I don't... I'm just pointing out that, you know, this is our issue, and we think it's a, I mean, it's part, it's, it's attached to, it's in the building permit file, it's part of the, the site plan, it's, I believe it's part of the building permit, so I understand about checks and balances and wanting to respect the duties of each department, but I guess overall I still, you know, again, the planning board created this neighborhood, and I would also submit that we'd be consistent with their plans for the neighborhood. So yeah, I, it's, a, it's an issue I hadn't anticipated, and, and as, going back to the process, we're trying to get information, we tried to provide everything that we, we had that we thought was relevant, and we've, I can attest to it personally, we learned a lot every day, it was a lot of work. And if it is an issue, I would just ask for the opportunity to, to think about it and get the documentation to respond to it. Um, and I understand the issue and I understand the competing interests, um, but I haven't given it the thought it, it, it deserves. Uh, let me throw in a personal opinion here. Uh, as a resident, not as a board member, it would if I lived in Stonegate, it would aggravate me if, if a developer came in and took down trees and, and uh, disrupted my 
previous natural entrance to my neighborhood. I mean, that aggravate me. I think it would aggravate anybody, and I certainly see your concern. Uh, that personal opinion aside, it, I want you to understand that as the board, I feel like we're representing you. We're trying to make your appeal work. We're on your side. Uh, we're, not on, we're not running defense for the code officer. We're here to hear your appeal, and if it works, we want it to work. That's our attitude and approach toward uh, all, of, all of our items as long as I've been on the board. Uh, so far, I'm having trouble finding a legal reason that the permit was issued incorrectly. Uh, if, if, and, and I've gone through them previously, so it, let me summarize the, the three lot issue. The worst case situation for the developer and the best case situation from your standpoint, I guess, is that if residency wasn't established, he can't create three lots, period. He can only create two. End of discussion, and that, that's all based on the residency status of, of the of the prior owner who subdivided the lot into three. If he had residence, then the two additional lots are legal. Uh, worst case is he can't carve off a third lot. He has to stop at two. That does not affect the building permit in any way. Whether the third lot is legal or not, at this point, uh, the, the smaller lot, lot or potentially increased size lot that the dwelling is being built on now meets all the state and local code requirements for a conforming lot. So uh, that's not an issue uh, in, in my mind. The, regarding the right of way, Stonegate Road, since that 134 feet was deeded to the town, it's been my understanding that a lot owner has the right to get to his lot. And if that causes, if that requires putting a driveway through a previously vegetated area, that that is acceptable in the in our town. Uh, I, and as an aside, I don't understand why a lot of vegetation was cleared. I don't understand why just a 19 foot, 15 foot driveway strip was carved into it. I'm sure the developer has a reason. Uh, if the if if he is going, and I assume these are spec houses, because I saw for sale signs out there. So I would certainly expect any developer to dress up his front yard if he hopes to sell the property. So I, that's not for me to answer. That's just an aside comment. Uh, why so much vegetation was removed, I don't know. Uh, again, that does not apply to the building permit. And that's our only uh, object here is, is, was the building permit issued in error? And so far, I'm not con you, I, I don't see any evidence that it was issued. Uh, if you do have anything else, uh, well, please, please let me know. the last point of it being an amendment to the subdivision. Uh, um, again, I could be more specific now. That would go on. I would have liked to have seen in the subdivision covenants that there would have been a three-foot walking path that, through there that, that can't be that, interrupted. Now, this is, that's the second issue um, I would suggest. This has to do with section 1625 of the town ordinance amendments to previously approved subdivisions. It states any change in improved final subdivision plan, including but not limited to lot lines, road layout, and location of structures improved, it must be reviewed and approved by the board. The minimum changes to an approved subdivision plan may be placed on the planning board consent agenda at the discretion of the town plan planner. Subsection B goes on to state that the minimum, the minimum changes shall not include an increase in the number of lots or units, a change to public or private right of way or easement, a decrease of proposed buffering or landscaping, meaning they are significant changes that require, the way I, I interpret it, that require planning board review. So that would be the third point um, that, that and, I would bring up. And, and uh, unrelated to the situation, that certainly should or could be addressed with between the subdivision and the developer. Why, why all the disruption? Why all the vegetation removed? But in this case, again, I don't think that addresses the fact that a driveway can't be put into the property. Well, the, the statute appears to me that 
say that is something to address by the planning board. And in that process, the developer and the neighbors would say, again, if you don't agree that you don't have a right to preserve the buffer, the planning board process is made for that. The developer says, I, this is why I need to drive away. This is the vegetation I'm going to put in. The towns, the neighbors say, well, you know, this needs to be done. What about the covenants? This house doesn't conform to covenants. And it specifically states a change to public or private right-of-way or easement and a decrease in proposed buffering landscaping. This is, in my opinion, satisfied, satisfied those two criteria, which triggers planning board review. So I, I understand your point about working this together, but it appears to me the statute says the proper place to do that is through the planning board. And it, it's, it makes sense. The planning board created some, the, going back to some other statements, the planning board created Stonegate. It did a great job. So this changes Stonegate. It's amendment to the filed plan. Let's get the planning board back. And let's, yeah, I just, again, I, and I appreciate what you said as a neighbor. And I also want to thank the town. They've been very cooperative. And we just want to see, you know, what has happened here and what's the proper way to proceed. So that's my suggestion on the last point. The planning process is available for an amendment to the subdivision. Why aren't we taking advantage of it? It doesn't make sense from a neighborhood perspective. It doesn't seem to make sense from a legal perspective. But, um, you know, the, the, the law is a complicated <laughs> animal. So, but again, from the neighborhood's perspective, the neighborhood's been created by the planning board, and this changes the neighborhood. Why isn't that change reviewed by the planning board with notice and public input? So that would be my last point on the third issue. Uh, <clears throat> Would you care to comment on that, please, our town attorney? On the last one? Yes, please. And, and in view of the sense, the 134-foot right-of-way was deeded to the town for town's use. It apparently still has some coverage under the covenants of the subdivision. Does, does the town's right to put a driveway into its property or the right to put in a property across town property to put in a driveway to a lot across town property, is that trumped by the subdivision covenants where they agree to maintain the property from a, a, a view standpoint, however the town owns right away? Would, would you mind going, uh, and, and I'm asking you that because the people at home need to hear you, if you would introduce yourself and, and uh, otherwise the people at home can't hear you unless you're at the microphone. Certainly. Uh, I'm John Wall with the firm of Monaghan Leahy, and I'm here representing the, the Zoning Board of Appeals in this matter. Um, it would be my opinion that absent some express restriction in either the deed or, or in fact, the covenants, if the covenants are incorporated, that prohibits the town from acting with this parcel as it would otherwise act with any other deeded parcel to the town, that uh, the town has the right to be able to, among other things, allow a, a driveway opening with regard to this particular law. Um, because otherwise, uh, you're, what you're dealing with is a, is a, um, a conveyance which is uh, subject to rights that are reserved by the, um, the owners of the subdivision. They have the right to go in and do certain things, and the town does not have the responsibility, perhaps, to maintain. But there's nothing in either that provision, as I read it, or in the deed itself, which says, and the town is restricted from either opening a portion of the vegetation to allow a driveway or some other type of, of action in that regard. And <clears throat> since all the roads in Stonegate are town maintained and repaired by the town, uh, uh, I think that is relevant. But again, I would the question or the point I was making didn't have to do with the deed, that was, the deed restriction. It has to do with is this an amendment under section 1625 of the Stonegate subdivision plan? And that does, I mean, clearly, to me anyway, and I'd be interested in the town attorney's opinion, it, clear, it says a change to a public or private right-of-way or, or easement. It seems like that's the case here. So if it's not, I guess I would just like some clarification on that point. And again, it, it, our interpretation, if that is the case, then it triggers planning board review. So that, 
that's, you know, I might have, you know, not stated that properly, but that's, I hope I did that time. <laughs> I, I, I understand. Mr. Smith. I just had a couple, couple of points from, from my standpoint. Um, I did quite a bit of research on the subdivision, and, and the map that's up here on the right shows uh, buffers, wetland buffers and buffers, and it shows some open space, but it doesn't show the right of way um, as having any protection as far as that map goes. I, th I think it, the 134 point something feet that's shown there was probably part of the original configuration of the lot, and evidently, the, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the developer didn't find any use for that, so he just, there was no practical use for it, other than maybe keep, you don't do it open space, so he deeded the whole, whole 134 feet rather than have a strip of land that was, that was not for other uses. I, I couldn't find anything, uh, although I can't find the minutes, I couldn't find anything in, in all the plans that they indicated that, that they even talked about this, this, this 134 feet. Um, and if you look at the covenants, the, the thing that, 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 uh, that got me when I read this was on the first page, it says, now for, therefore, declarant hereby declares that the property described above, excepting, excepting lot number 52, excepting that area shown as common open space on the plan, and excepting those areas shown as roads on the plan, shall be held, sold, and conveyed subject to the following easements, restrictions, covenants, and conditions. That's clear to me that, that the road system, the right-of-way system, didn't have anything to do with the covenants. It would be very unusual to have a, a road that's going to be turned over uh, to the town for a public way to have to be included in the covenants. If it was a private way, then, then there would be covenants that would, that would have been subject, the roads would have been subject to covenants because an association would have taken that on when the, when the developer left. And, and there, there could be covenants in that respect. Um, as far as is uh, Mr. Malley have a reliance on me for driveways, he does ask it, it, uh, if, if, it's, if it's clear as far as any other approvals before he issues a driveway permit. Um, it, so he asked me in this particular case, did it need any kind of review by planning board? And I said no. Um, he, he issued a driveway permit on this right away as he would on any right away. And which he's done thousands of times. Um, it just happens to be a wider right away. So that's why that's where there was that's where all the concern is. But if, if indeed the whole system was, was 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 based on the covenants, then then the town couldn't even exercise the right to maintain that right away by taking dead trees or anything without having to go back to, to the association. I don't believe that the town, from my standpoint, would get into a situation where they'd have to rely on somebody else once it belongs to them, unless it was specifically something they agreed to in the deed. And I don't see that. Um, let's see. I, I think we're a little, uh, I'm a little confused on the clearing of vegetation um, on the lot itself. Um, I know a lot of the vegetation, the natural vegetation was cleared off the, within the right of way. I'm not sh so sure how much was cleared off the land, but anybody has a right, whether it's divided into three lots or one lot, they, they can take all the vegetation on their own property. There's no law saying they can't do that unless there's, unless there's a wetlands issue or some other issue that disallows that. So I don't think that's, a, that's an issue. Um, let's see, what else did I have? I guess that's all I have. There is a landscape plan up here that, that clearly shows the areas uh, adjacent to the, to, to the Mitchell Road where the signage is and there's a rock wall there that, 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 that I believe that's what they're talking about, the landscape, the rock wall to maintain that. Um, and, and it really doesn't cover anything beyond the road to Denver that's on the end, which is still there. So I don't believe that, that the, at least the, the buffered uh, landscape plan has been has been uh, 
violated at all. When I can understand or when I can see. And your reference earlier to lot, what was it, 54? or Lot 52, that's... And that, that coincides with this 134-foot stone. I'm not road. sure what the, what the significance of lot 52 is. It, it may be property that was outside of the stone gate realm. Can I make a point of clarification? The covenants were recorded two years before the deed to the town. So the deed to the town is a subsequent expression of the party's intent. So the, sub, the covenants say this is excluded, but you have a deed two years later, which we provide copies, I think you have a copy, says they're subject to the covenants. I would submit that they are subject to the covenants. And I, I guess, what does that mean then? If it doesn't mean what we suggest it means, it's clearly in the deed. So it must mean something. We suggested what we think it means, but I guess my request would be, what does the town think it's, it well, means? <clears throat> I get one, one more point. Please. Um, a buffer is usually services, serves some kind of uh, purpose, such as a site plan to shield it from a business from, from light, uh, from, from the parking area and the like. Um, it, and if there's a buffer in the subdivision, it has to serve some purpose. I'm not so sure why the planning board would be concerned to have a buffer to a, 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 a vacant area that, that's, that's not unlike what was there to begin with. So I'm not sure why, why the planning board would even be concerned to, 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 to require a buffer there. I can see, I can understand that the landscape area, uh, that's typical. I haven't, I haven't any indication in, in, in the files that I've been through probably four times to indicate that there was anything that the plan would really want it. But all all other that. issues aside, just to clarify a point you made earlier, putting a driveway from Stonegate to a lot does not require planning board approval. Is that correct? It, not on a, 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 a public right of way. If, if indeed the, the, the developer had left, like you say, a three foot walking path or even a strip of land that, that, that he would have control of, that he could pass on to the, to the association because he wanted to have the control of that for whatever reason, whether it be to, to pick up extra money when somebody wanted to, to enter onto that road, they'd have to deal with him because he owned a strip or, or if there was some other reason. But there's nothing to indicate a discussion like that was anything. There are no restrictions. Is, uh, therefore, <clears throat> planning board review is not necessary to put in a driveway. Is that correct? It, it's that in this situation. Planning board don't have to review driveways off of public ways. Okay. Uh, it, it, from what you have indicated to us, there, other than the term buffer, uh, there appear to be no other restrictions on that, that land. Is that correct? Oh, sorry. That's okay. I did the same thing. No, um, I guess I'm still going back to section 16.25. And why is running a dry, driveway into Stonegate Road not a amendment to the Stonegate Ordinance under section 16.25? which clearly, again, it addresses a public way. That it's in the words of the ordinance. So if you could take a look at that and give me your thoughts on that. Again, the way I look at it is this is a change to Stonegate subdivision. It's not just a right-of-way. It's a right-of-way into a subdivision. So 16.25 says amendment to the subdivision planning board review. Um, you know, who's to say what the planning board would, would, would do, but the proper body to make that decision is the planning board under 16.25. In, in the ordinance, I was looking to see if there's a definition of a buffer, and there is none. Uh, but I'm just going back to, the, again, the public. I'm not, well... They talk about a buffer as well, but it also talks about a change to the public way and a decrease in buffering or landscaping. 
And again, the way I, I look at it is that triggers planning board review as an amendment to the Stonegate subdivision plan but through the words of the clear words of the statute. And if I'm misinterpreting that or if the town has a different interpretation or perspective, I guess what I'm, that's what I'm trying to get at. Specific to that statute, not the deeds, not the covenants, but this statute, 1625, that requires planning board review of an amendment to a subdivision. But, uh, excuse me, I, I, I'd just like to touch upon the meaning of why that's in there. It, 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 what it does is separates a de minimis change to what would be a regular change. And, and so it, it, puts, it, it brings a point forward those points so that somebody has a clear guidance on, of what a de minimis change is, not, not no more than that. It, that's what I believe the reason for that is. The reason for being what? The, the reason that wording is in there is to, is to, is to, is to, is to have a clarification between what is, is, is a de minimis change and what would require something more than a de minimis change. Uh, Otherwise, that wording I don't believe would be in there. Are you also referring to that paragraph that you read earlier? Subdivision 16. Okay. Yeah, and was that relevant to that paragraph you read earlier where Lot 52 was specifically excluded? Lot 52, I'm not sure what the significance of Lot okay. 52 is. No, that has to do with the covenants. Okay. This has to do uh, with the statute. And again, it, it, defines what a de, it's, it defines what a diminished change is not. And I guess the implication is if it's not a diminished change, it's a significant change. Because I think the guidance is, oh, well, we're just changing the driveway. We have, it's the public right-of-way. Or we're just chopping down a couple of trees. But this says that's not a de minimis change. And the logic, I think, reading the section is, well, that means it's whatever the opposite de minimis is, de maximis, that requires planning board review. That's how I look at it. So I guess I would just, you know, in the legal review of this from the town's perspective, I would just ask. <clears throat> Mr. Smith, I, maybe you can answer this. As far as clearing vegetation on town property, that buffer, uh, it, are there any restrictions from a developer clearing trees on town property? But well, you call it a buffer. I'm, I'm yet to convince, be convinced that it is a buffer. No. <laughs> We've been using that term only 134 feet. Uh, road extension in question. Uh, that's clearly town property. It's deeded. That 134 feet was deeded to the town. What right does an individual have to clear anything beyond a path for a driveway, a 15-foot path for a driveway? It's been common practice over the years that, that everybody, everybody, most people do pretty much what they want as long as it's a, a safety issue sight distance or, or room to put the snow, as long as none of that has been compromised. Uh, people put fences, they put rock walls, they put uh, uh, vegetation, they do that, and the town, knowing full well that if they ask the question, the town's going to say, well, whatever you put in there, if, if it has to be removed, so be it. So people, people have a bonus of sometimes 15 or 20 feet or even more, but in, in this particular case, He's right. This person has 80 feet that, that, that he's going to be able to, you know, pretty much n not control, but, but it, it's there. And, and no, I don't think people are going to go camping there because they don't live there. You know, so it, it's not unusual to, to maintain and mow and do whatever you do with the net right away. Um, like I say, if they ask the question, we, we tell them that, you know, whatever you do, you can't. You can't compromise sight distance, uh, and, you, and it could be removed tomorrow if the town decides they have to do some work or wide, no, for whatever reason. So, um, which goes back to my point I was mentioning earlier. I, I've had standard standard boundary surveys done on properties that I own, and I was astounded at how far the town right of way extended onto my lot and neighbor's lot, and expensive landscaping, and so on and so forth. Uh, 50 feet just for a 20-foot road. So depending on where that road is in the 50-foot right-of-way, you could have 20, 25 feet of front yard that you really don't own or homeowner really doesn't own. Uh, this happens to be 80 feet. Uh, 
again, I'm having difficulty finding a legal, and, and we act as a, a quasi-judicial board here. I'm finding, having difficulty finding a, a legal handle to hang my hat on to. I, I guess I would ask. And, and the town attorney also said that, that town-owned property can be used earlier, just to remind you, can be used to put in a driveway. So. But I guess I would ask the town attorney's opinion on, this, on the amendment to the Stonegate subdivision. But I would also ask if there's any experience in the town with running driveways through subdivision entrances like Cross Hills or any, um, uh, any of the other subdivisions in the town that have been planned. Is there any experience with running driveways right through their entrance? Because if you, we've done this so many times with right-of-ways, but have you done this any time with a subdivision right-of-way where it's been created under subdivision law, where there's a reservation right in the deeds with covenants and where a neighbor has maintained it for decades? Are there any experiences that are common to that? Because I think it requires a different analysis. And again, I, there's, a lot of laws I've pointed to that I, we submit that supports that. But, you know, our, our last law to point to is the amendment for a subdivision. This isn't a sub, is it not, I guess, do you say this, this land is not part of a subdivision? It's not part of Stonegate, is Stonegate Road not part of a su subdivision that was laid out in a subdivision process? Okay, yes or no, if it is, then why is not this not an amendment under this statute? This, or, this would be the legal, I would ask you to consider putting your hat on this, this, sub, this section in the town ordinance 1625. To answer your question, um, the planning board is very sensitive when they, when they approve subdivisions to make sure that lots that, 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 that may be beyond the subdivision, uh, that they get a right to come off that road with a, with, with a, with a, with a, with a driveway or whatever to get to that. And you'll see it on, on all most plans. They didn't do that here because there was frontage that was already there. Uh, I, 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 I believe that, that if, if that had been one lot back and the only logical way to get to that was, would be from that subdivision road, that they probably would have set aside a 50 foot swath or required the, the developer to set aside a 50 foot swath so that that lot could be developed in some future future date, and, and you'll see it, if you go up there, you'll see any of the subdivisions, you'll see where they, they, they've required roads or right-of-ways back to a lot of property. So I think they're sensitive to that issue. Well, but it, there wasn't need at this point for that. But at this point, why wouldn't they be sensitive to a change in the subdivision under Section 1625? It just seems like there's, there's a law here that would provide for planning board review, and they can decide whether this is something that was standard for all subdivisions, or if it was standard at that time, or maybe it was a standard 10 years after that. Um, I guess my point is, is, this is an amendment to the subdivision plan, and the planning board reviews those under the statute. So I don't want to belabor the point, but I just- You're saying the building permit made changes to the subdivision? Yes. The building permit didn't give the driveway permit, did it? the right away no I, I, that's a legal issue I it's in there's a building permit there's a driving application in it I mean your I argument just want somebody to listen to I mean your argument is, is bef your argument on the buffer and the right away is before this town council right now isn't it yes and that's and a I, separate issue from the building permit well I that it could be argued that way. I would su submit that it's part. I mean, how do you build a house without a driveway? But you're asking us to, to say that uh, that uh, uh, there was a violation of your subdivision because of the building permit when that lot that the building permit was given to has nothing to do with the subdivision. But the access to the lot does. I don't. Building I don't permit know. didn't give the access to the lot which takes it out from under our jurisdiction. And it was identified earlier that the lot could be accessed from, from, uh, uh, from the primary road, the main road, uh, Mitchell Road. I guess if you, cut, if you take the driveway away, then, yeah, the lots, I mean, it's there, but yeah, the lots, the lots are out, 
clearly outside the subdivision. But, you know, one driveway that exists is on to Mitchell Road for the house that pre-existed. So you remove the, the driveway, the driveways are through the buffer, that's the issue with the neighborhood. So if you do remove the driveway access and separate that from the building permit, um, it's definitely more of a challenging argument. We do have two issues. We do have the issuance of the building permit and uh, uh, the argument that, 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 there, that, that sh there's an amendment to a subdivision plan, existing subdivision plan, that should have gone to the planning board. So you do have to address each one of those. There were the three arguments here. Originally it was an illegal subdivision because it was divided into three or more lots and there was an exemption. Um, and then the, the, the issuance of a building permit and the and, and there's an amendment to a, to a previously approved subdivision. So the, 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 the split of the three lots, if there is a violation there, it's yet to be determined that there is, but if there is, then that'll take care of itself because um, I'm gonna investigate further to, to, to find out whether he did qualify for that exemption. If he didn't, he'll go back, he'll be sent to the planning board. That issue is, no matter what you decide, is out there anyways. Now you have to decide whether the building permit, um, the issuance of building permit, there was a violation because he issued the building permit. And you have to, have to uh, uh, decide whether it needed an amendment to the Stonegate subdivision. So you have two, one that's, I think, take care of itself, and two that you have to make a decision on. Well, I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out why number three, how does number three come into play to this? Was the building permit issued, violated the subdivision? The division into three or more lots? No, three or more lots is question number one. That's, we've got to find out whether the guy was a resident or not. But that doesn't affect the permit. Per, building permit was issued based on the lot that was there outside of Stonegate. And then the third question is the Stonegate subdivision violation. Did the building permit violate the subdivision? No, but unlike the division of the three or more lots, if there's an amendment to a previously approved subdivision, that has to be taken care of before they issue a building permit. It's clear that that has to be taken care of. So you, what that charge was to just decide whether I should have done that. Uh, based on it, on the fact that it was or wasn't an amendment to previously approved subject. So, so what we have to do is look at <clears throat> Exhibit A to the Rachel Declaration Subdivision Plan, and see if adding these two driveways at, is, a, is a the, more than a de minimis change to this plan as filed. That's correct. That's our task. Correct. And with the guidance of the statute cited. Would you agree with that? What's that? Would you agree that the statute or ordinance I cited on subdivision amendments would be applicable? Be yeah. for the de minimis. That defines the de minimis. What's not de minimis? I don't. I don't believe. I'm not quite following the question, but I don't believe that 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 it needed an amendment based on that section. But would you agree that's a section to look to? I would agree. Okay. Yes. I would as well. Uh, I, I don't know if this is a point of issue or not, but looking at the property map, this is the lot in question. There appear to be three previously declared lots, 9A, 9C, and an unnamed lot in the middle. We all have driveways on Mitchell Road that appear, do not appear in this Stonegate subdivision plan. So this was previously subdivided. I, I can't see that. This is, this is from town map U50. It's an enlargement of town map U50. I'm referring to 9A, 9C, and an unidentified lot in the yeah, middle. That would be the lot between the lot, two acre lot at issue. This would 
Looks like the neighbors have had their three driveways going up to Mitchell. One lot over, right? But is it? That's correct. Yeah, here's, here's the entrance of the plot. This is the plot that was subdivided. Correct. But I mean, this is the, east, the, the neighboring lot, it looks like. I'm not, I have no look at this, but that's how it appears to me. So 9B is the one that was. Yeah, this. That's a lot in question. This is, 9B is a lot of issue. And the, these are three lots that are. That yeah, that map is there, but yeah, 9B is now here. But. And that's, that's, that's how we look at the three. Right, correct. And this is just the neighboring lot. Well, I would, I, I, the, I would say that was at one time part of this lot because it's got all the. It's but got that, the, the, some other point before the, this year. Now. No. My, thank you. My question, Mr. Smith, is how are we to determine whether this lot conforms to the Stonegate master plan? Is what you were saying is the third point. Whether we can, the lot can be divided as per the Stonegate covenants or master plan. That was your third point, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I think it's not so much the division of lots beyond the road, but it's it's the, the basis, the, the revision to the amendment to because it's access of of Stonegate Road and a buffer may have been the contention that the, the buffer was should have been approved to clear but the plan of board. I don't think that the other lots really have been okay. to do. The, my question is, our, it appears to me and it appears to our town attorney that this 134 feet that was deeded to the town, driveway can be placed across it. And I don't see evidence otherwise. That's one issue, yes. But. I guess we raised three issues. The first one, I guess, was addressed, from my understanding of your position, is on the residency, which will be investigated. The second one has to do with interpretation of the deed, subdivision law, um, common practices, what have you. And then the third one is this one that's sort of lingering out there, <laughs> trying to get, is whether or not the access to Stonegate Road is an amendment to the Stonegate subdivision plan. So that would be the third. It doesn't have anything to do with the covenants, and I agree. And it has to do with the access off to Stonegate Road, which is part of the file subdivision plan for Stonegate. And, and by default, if you if you decide that that needs an amendment, the building permit has to, you know it, the building permit would be would be stopped and would go back before the board. So really, that is the issue. If if we determined it needed an amendment. Then the building permit would that, be that generally is that's done before the issuance of a building permit. So if you determine that that if you determine that that there's, there's, it doesn't need an amendment, then 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 they, everything's okay as far as legal goes from your standpoint. Uh, to access it from Stone and access to, in order to access no, no, a lot from there Stone Gate. If you, you, it, it, simply you either determine that it, it is an amendment. What, what he's done is an amendment to a previously approved subdivision and therefore it has to go back to the planning board or it, or it is not amendment. And once you make that decision, the building permit, if you make the decision that, that, that it, that it uh, but you, you know what I'm saying here. Yeah, the building permit shouldn't have been issued if, there was, if it was an illegal amendment to the Right, if I made, <laughs> the, I made a call that should have been the planning boards. Sure. Then, then it should go back to the planning board, and, and that will that will stop the issue, the the issuance of the building permit. That will stop. stop but in now absent, that's taken care. Of. In that, am, I, am I correct in assuming? In absence of no restrictions on that right of way that was passed to the town, 
it appears that no amendment is needed. That's for you to decide. Okay. Um, but if I could just, again, um, I would suggest that the deed and the restrictions in the deed don't relate to that third issue, but the statute relates to that third issue, the ordinance, which, if you'd like, do you have a copy of that? I could. Was, was it in, in your? Uh, yes, it, I, I believe it was in the initial application. In, I can tell you. I'd like to ask our. Might have been cited in the text of it. Yes, it's in. It's on the third page of the Weatherby's application, paragraph twelve. Does in that amendment sixteen dash two dash five you're referring to? Yes, sir. Does it mention driveway? Access to lot? It mentions both private and public. It addresses both the change to a public or private right of way of easement. And it's highlighted both in, in the. And where, where is that wording? Subsection B. B. Subsection B is in boy. I'd like to ask our attorney two points, please, if I may. Uh, regarding the interpretation of 16-2-5, section B, item number two, does that apply to a driveway? What's the second question? Uh, in, in your view of, of this whole concept of putting a driveway across this 134-foot uh, town owned property. Do you see any relevancy for uh, the uh, rule of adverse possession as far as the homeowner's right to this in view of putting a driveway across that area? Please. In view of the Homeowners Association management and maintenance of that strip, does the rule of adverse possession apply? Okay, let me, uh, I'm going to answer your two questions, but um, I'm going to take the uh, invitation of uh, Mr. Campbell uh, to, to sort of make a, a, a more general point about the section he's referring to, which is section 1625 of the subdivision ordinance. Um, I did research on this point um, expecting that there would be some kind of clear law on what constitutes a change of a final subdivision, uh, final subdivision plan in the context of an, a butter to a subdivision requesting uh, entry into a public road, whether that request constitutes a, a change to an approved final subdivision plan. Um, finding none, it would be my, no law that clearly uh, construes that, it, it would be my opinion that such a, a request by an abutter to a subdivision would not implicate a change to the final subdivision plan. Uh, so therefore, I think as a general matter, the issue that's being raised um, is obviated by the fact that it's, we're not really talking about a change to a final subdivision plan. But to address your other two questions more specifically, the adverse possession issue, generally speaking, concepts like uh, prescriptive use and adverse possession do not apply as against municipalities. Okay. So therefore, um, the rights that would uh, be sought to um, be enforced as against a party, in this case, it would be the, the subdivision owners, subdivision uh, uh, homeowners uh, attempting to enforce a restriction as on the property owner, which in this case would be the, the town, in order to grant this entry into the, the town road. And that being the circumstance, I don't believe adverse possession would apply. Okay. Um, the other point is whether or not subpart two would apply. 
under um, 1625 subpart B. Um, if you set aside for a moment the more generalized comment that I made about whether it applies at all. Um, again, there's no law that indicates what is meant by that particular provision since I think the town has the right um, to make changes to any public way without any type of requesting any modification to the final subdivision plan. It would be my interpretation, my opinion, that that provision has to be interpreted to uh, relate to legal rights, changes in legal rights that pertain to public or private right-of-ways or easements that are subject to the approved subdivision plan. And since what we're talking about in the context of this particular uh, permit is the right to access a lot that is outside the subdivision um, and is attempting to access a public roadway, um, I do not see that it's changing any legal rights with respect to the public way and therefore it would not be precluded as a non-de minimis change to the final subdivision plan. That would be my, my comment on, on both of those specific points. Do you have anything else? So to summarize, if I understand you correctly, putting in a driveway would not require an amendment to the subdivision. In this context, we're dealing with a, an, uh, particularly we're dealing with an abutter to the subdivision plan seeking to um, access their property by going to a public road. I, I believe it would not. And it s seems to make sense that if there is a property, a buildable lot of record, which this has, this apparently is, whether it's the second and final or the second of three lots if, to be determined, if this is a buildable lot of record, it would make sense that the town would, it would be understood that you would be able to access your property from a public right of way. I think that's a fair observation. Okay, thank you. Uh, more than Mr. Chairman, I guess, I guess I would also find it strange that, that a taxpayer supported street would, that the town would, can act, could actually give up taxpayers' rights in that street to a private association. Uh, it seems to me the association wants it both ways. They want the taxpayers to pay for and maintain the road while maintaining their own restrictions on that road, and that just doesn't seem right to me. Any other comment? Uh, Seeing none, if everybody, I'd like to take comments from the audience. First, I'd like to start out, um, unless you have a... No, nope, thank you. I just want to thank you for your uh, time. I'd like to have comments from the audience. I'd like to start out, if I may, we'd like to, in two different, one in support of the administrative appeal, and, and then any opposition to the administrative appeal will take second. So if you would, come to your uh, podium and state your name and address, please. Thank you very much. My name's Bob Steer. I live at Nine Rockcrest Drive, just around the corner from the entrance to Stonegate. And it is the entrance that I use typically many times a day. Um, and my interest in speaking with you is not to prolong things. I appreciate the time that you voluntarily given to do this. Um, but I want to address, Mr. Chairman, the specific question that you raise, because it's an important one, and I'm not sure that it's really received the attention that it deserves. And that is, what's wrong with issuing the building permit here? Let's put aside now the issue of the driveway. That's an issue that I'm intimately familiar with because that's the subject of my own appeal to the town council. Um, but let me focus instead on what happened here and whether the appeal of the building permit is something 
that deserves your attention and deserves for you to say, that shouldn't have happened the way it did. And this, this is my point. The residents of Stonegate simply want their expectations to be honored that the law will be followed. That's it. And what is the law? Maine Statute Title 30A, Section 4406, set subsection 1, says, no person may sell, lease, develop, build upon, or convey for consideration, or offer or agree to lease, sell, develop, build upon, or convey con for consideration, any land or dwelling unit in a subdivision that has not been approved by the municipal reviewing authority. Was this in a subdivision? There can be no doubt that the land that Mr. Wolfkanish had was divided into three parcels. Now, we can speculate what would have happened if he had only divided it into two parcels, but that's not what he did. The facts are undisputable. There was a single piece of land, and it was divided into three parcels. Under the law, that was a subdivision. And, the sub and a subdivision must be approved before it can be built upon. Now, let, let me interrupt. There are, there, uh, excuse me. I thought we established early on that in the state of Maine, a homeowner that has established five years of residency in a property can split off two lots. And I ask if that was a true statement. And with attorneys present, no one challenged that. So I still stand by that statement that if that under the state of Maine that has a right to split off two additional lots. That, there are some nuances to that, so let me go into that. But, at least to begin with, what we had here, the facts are, that there was a, there were, was a parcel split into three lots by Mr. Wavkanish. It's also a fact that a year before he did that, nearly a year before he did that, he asked the town to remove his homestead exemption and produced evidence satisfactory to the town that he was a resident of Florida. Excuse me, we have already addressed that issue also in, in the sense that the worst case situation, he was not a, for him, for the developer, that he was not a resident, and in which case he has a new owner has a right to divide the lot into two and proceed with it. Again, we're just addressing the building permit. That's Whether right. it's two lots or three, was the building permit appropriate? And whether it's two lots or three is not our concern. Well, it, it is, it if, should have been. If it's two lots, worst case, two lots, he has a right to build on it. it. The facts are not two or three. The facts are undisputed. The parcel was divided into three lots. Now, there are exceptions to the definition of subdivision. And one of those exceptions provides that in determining whether a tract or parcel of land is divided into three or more lots, it's an exception where both dividings are accomplished, and this is in Title 30A, Section 4401. When if there's an exception where both dividings are accomplished by a subdivider who has retained one of the lots for the subdivider's own use as a single-family residence, 
That has been the subdivider's principal residence for a period of at least five years immediately preceding the second subdivision. Now, what that suggests to me is when you have a parcel that's been divided into three lots and somebody wants to build on one of those lots, the code enforcement officer has the obligation to determine whether or not planning board approval is necessary. And it's necessary unless, unless the exception applies. And there is no reason, and, and Mr. Smith didn't indicate that he ever asked for any proof that the exception applies here. In fact, what we have is evidence suggesting to the contrary, that not only is there no evidence that the exception does apply, but there is affirmative evidence that the exception would not apply. I can see whether I, I the, the question of the building permit applies only for lot number three. And you were correct at that point. Lot number three may not be a valid lot. And that is to be determined by residency status of the prior owner who subdivided the property. Lot number three only. Uh, any way you look at it, it's okay for you to walk up, buy that property, divide it into two, and get a building permit tomorrow. You can do that. That is not what happened. And okay. any lot... There were three lots. We understand there were three lots. Right. The third lot could be voided, is what I'm saying. That's not our concern tonight. Our concern is on the... I'm calling the homestead, the original house, lot number one, the new construction, lot number two, and the third yet to be developed third lot. So lot number two, the one of new construction, is where the permit has been issued. Right. Lot number three is, is yet to be determined. Stop. If lot number three is voided by residency, omission of residency status, then I can see where instead of three, it ends, the parcel ends up being two larger lots. It's not, not a three. question of whether the division was voided or not. The question is, do you issue a building permit on one of three parcels in a subdivision when that subdivision hasn't been approved and you don't have proof that the exception applies. That's the problem. But at this Mr. point, Mr. Smith it's not had the obligation to say, unless you want to take this to the planning board, which we all would have been happy with because then we have some input, what, what he should have said and this is an unusual situation, I don't hold it against him because this is not normal, but what he should have said is, look, it looks to me like there were three lots here. That requires planning board approval unless you convince me otherwise. He didn't do that. He didn't get any evidence that the exception applies. And under the circumstances, he should not have issued a building permit for that land. It, 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 uh, I am not defending Mr. Smith in the least, I can assure you. But when a code officer is approached for building permit, it's not the code officer's responsibility to go back and check residency status. I mean, that's, he, does it meet the I, ordinance? I didn't does say it, it was. Does it have foot of frontage? Is it a conforming lot? Does it have the square footage, so on and so forth? Absolutely. The burden He's is not. on the applicant for the permit to convince Mr. Smith that the exception applies. Otherwise, he should do what he does in any situation where he's got a building that is proposed to be put on one of three subdivided lots. He should say, I can't do that unless it's approved. That requires planning board approval. That's what the state statute says. And unless you convince me that that law doesn't apply to your situation, then you're going to have to go to the planning board. But my, I certainly see your point fully. 
But looking at the lot that requested a building permit, uh, the ordinance was followed. The third lot certainly is the issue here regarding that. Can a, can a third lot be, a third property be divided out of the original lot? That's the question, and I made that point early on. It depends on the residency status of the owner, the prior owner who subdivided it. Neither That does not apply to us tonight, the third lot. We're only talking about a building permit on a lot that meets requirements. Well, I, I, was, I was hoping to address your point. I think there's a fundamental disagreement here about what happens when a parcel is subdivided into three. You cannot pretend that that subdivision did not happen. It did. And the laws that apply, apply to the entire subdivision of three parcels. And no building could be permitted on any one of those without planning board approval. That's my point. Now, I know Mr. Smith has a different point that he would like to raise with you as well. If, if there are no other questions, I'll be happy to address any questions. I, I don't want to... Thank you for your comments. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Joe Stevens. I reside at 7 Granite Ridge Road in, um, in Stonegate, Cape Elizabeth. And I only want to address one point, and it's a point that you discussed. So if you'll just indulge me for a minute, I want to ask you all... Um, in regards to it is section 16.2-5. And why this section is, is, is so important and was a focus of, of, of the appeal is because really it would have probably eliminated the need for this this evening. Um, it would have brought the application before the planning board. It would have pulled the community in, the developer in, for the negotiations that you see so often during the planning process and during the site planning process. It happens all the time, and that's what the board's there for. Um, that section says, under Section A, scope, it says any change to a final subdivision plan, any. That's a scope goes back to the planning board. Any change. The position I think that, that um, Mr. Campbell was trying to make, and was making, is, is that two things, that accessing the issuing the building permit and accessing uh, Stonegate Road, which was part of the original subdivision, right? It was all part of the subdivision plan, constitutes any change, any change to the subdivision plan. And I also believe that by eliminating the landscaping, because it talks about discrete um, decrease in proposed buffering or landscaping, not deed restricted buffering or landscaping, just proposed landscaping and buffering, and clearly this section is part of the landscaping and buffering of the community. On Stonegate Road, which was part of the original parcel that was subdivided, even though it was granted by deed to the town, it was part of the original subdivision, clearly is any change to the approved plat. Now, there's a carve-out for that that says that we have de minimis changes that can also go to the planning board as a consent item. That would have been okay by us, too, because we would have got up when it went up for consent item and say, we disagree as an association or as some of the members. And then the board might have voted us and said, it is de minimis, sorry, thank you, sit down. Or they might have said, well, with all these people here, it's not de minimis. It must be important, which it is, obviously, because we're all here this evening, and they might have given us an opportunity to participate in that amendment. So I ask respectfully to the town council, the town, when I say council, I mean the town attorney, um, that you, you look at this section again closely, that he look at it. I do not believe it's one that you can go to case law to get an answer to. The expressed language of the statute is any change. And so you may make the determination that this isn't a change to the subdivision plan, and if you make that determination, fine. But if it is, then whether it's a good change, a bad change, or one that's permitted and the planning board should ultimately approve, maybe even is legally obligated to approve, maybe, maybe not, is not the question. The question is, does it go before them? And I, and I respectfully submit that it does. And, and, and I thank you, like the other speakers this evening, for your time. Uh, earlier, 
uh, regarding your second, second point there, earlier counsel did state that he did not feel that putting in a drive affected that 134 feet. Um, I don't know if the counsel uh, care, uh, cares to comment on the first point. Is this considered a change to the subdivision plan by subdividing a lot in that? Please. Thank you for your You're welcome. Comment. I would just make, make the, I, you can come right up. I'll be very brief. <laughs> I, 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 I am not taking issue with whether or not is it a, it's a change that might ultimately be required to be approved. It may or may not. My only issue is should it not be before the planning board instead of you? That's right. Uh, you're talking about dividing that lot, is that correct? Yes, thank you. Yes, amending the subdivision plan. That's thank you for your comments. Thank you. I just want to make sure I understand what your question is. Uh, earlier I asked you regarding point, uh, uh, point number B2, whether putting in a drive had a change to public or pri private right-of-way or easement, and your determination was that it did not. He brings up a bit of a different point, and that is subdividing a lot. Is that considered a change to the subdivision plan? Well, as I understand it, these lots are not in the subdivision. So that wouldn't implicate the subdivision plan. I, I mean, this that's, that's a factual matter, which I so think this, has been this established. entire lot, 9B, is not, Bravo, non Bravo, is not a part of the subdivision. That, my understanding is that it's not. Okay. But, uh, that's obviously a factual matter for you to decide and whether or not it's been stipulated to, I don't know, but... Well, was it in the... I don't know if you're the one to address this. Was it in the master plan, the developer's plan? Was this lot show, shown as part of the Stonegate subdivision? You're talking about the lot that's been divided and Nine, on which the building... 9B. Okay. It's my understanding it's not, but that's, again, that's a factual matter that I think... Do you is, concur with that, Mr. Smith? Yes. Okay. Thank if you, you. If you look at Exhibit A to Rachel's statement, that's the subdivision plan, and it's, the lot's not included in the subdivision. It's not included. Correct. Okay. Uh, which, which has a bearing on your first point, wherever you... Has a bearing on your first point, that that, that lot is not part of the subdiv subdiv Stonegate subdivision master plan or developer's plan, whichever you want to call it. That lot was not a part of that, so therefore it's not subject to jurisdiction of the covenants for Stonegate and is not considered a subdivision of a Stonegate parcel because it's not a Stonegate parcel. I, I recognize that. I don't understand you, you need to come up. If you're going to talk, you need to come up here. I, I, I recognize that, Mr. Chair, that, that that parcel is not. What I, the position that I was making is that the change is when the buffering or landscaping is, is clear. Even though it's within a town right-of-way, the town right-of-way was originally part of the Stonegate subdivision, the overall plat, and that accessing that area was a change. That's all, and it, and, and it, was, it, it falls into any change. That's how broad the statute is. If you want to touch a subdivision plat, that's what it says to me, that we approved the planning board and spent all this time and money to do, you come back to us. And maybe it's de minimis and we just do a consent, and maybe it's not. Anything. That's the position. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My name is Piotr Stamieszki. I live at 5 Granite Ridge Road. And there was a question here whether these slots are part of a subdivision. And clearly they are not. I heard they are not. The question of what? The question was whether these two lots, new lots, are part of a Stonegate subdivision, and the answer was no, they are outside of subdivision. However, I think you have to look at the intentions of a developer. These lots were marketed as a new development in Stonegate. Consequently, my point is, if it's marketed as a new development in Stonegate, the intention is to associate with Stonegate. Therefore, it affects the development. Therefore, it's an amendment to subdivision. Therefore, it should go to the planning board. If it had been marketed as two lots, two houses, this argument wouldn't exist. But clearly, the statements made by the developer were, I'm selling two lots in the Stonegate, a new development in the Stonegate. Therefore, I think, uh, it should be looked at as a part of Stonegate development, by the words of a developer. Thank you. So what you're saying is that there is misrepresent, possible misrepresentation. I'm, I'm saying if a developer represents a new development in Stonegate, then let's look at it as new development in Stonegate and, and treat it as amendment to Stonegate subdivision. If developer were not said that, obviously this argument wouldn't exist. 
So again, I, I, I cannot get into this misrepresentation and marketing methods, but my point is if the intention is that, then you should recognize that intention, develop, basically the intention of developer, and say, okay, you want to market it this way, you present it this way, let's send it to the planning board to look at a Stonegate subdivision with a two, two new lots, two new developments. This is what I would propose to you. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carolyn Homer, and I live at 4 Rockcrest Drive, and there hasn't been a morning that I have not woke up um, thinking about this and how all my investment in uh, Cape Elizabeth and in my home that I've lived now for 14 years has, um, which is my nest egg, has now been disturbed. Um, the only way I could feel like I can approach is how, you know, I did make a couple of pages that I took off of our declarations that helped me explain this. But for me, a Cape Elizabeth planning board um, has agreed to the whole plan that was there. And when we deeded it to you, it was that you're there, now you're going to be protecting us too. And I feel as also a property owner of Cape Elizabeth that you're here to protect me as a homeowner and what I bought into this town for. Um, if I could sell my house tomorrow, I would. Because it just feels like that sometimes the town is not there to protect you anymore. You know, we're giving you our tax dollars and a lot more money than, you know, than we all have extra. Some people have it, but we don't. Okay. The one part about Stonegate in that area was is that it's natural setting. It's not, um, the homes aren't in close um, vicinities to each other like they would in Oakhurst. And I think in developing it 20 years ago, they were seeing this. They did not want this to happen where we, we need the open space in between each of the homes so that it has that natural park-like uh, setting. And I think that is a point where I did um, write to all of you. I believe I gave somebody 10 copies of a letter from me. I don't know where he went. Somebody in your office took them and said everybody would get them. Um, I don't know if you've even read all the letters from people. Okay. And one thing in there is that this whole idea of our stone gate, if people look at it, is we've got a green belt in there. And, you know, sometimes I'm annoyed by the green belt because there's, you know, five young men, business guys out there, and they decide to take a jog and discuss things at 5.30 in the morning. And when my dogs hear that at 5.30 in the morning, I'm not too happy because that wakes me up. And it's very annoying. And... Um, I am, you know, by the rules of you also, is that I am not allowed to cut anything, anything out of our so-called building lot when you said that we cleared a lot of lots. Well, that was in, I would say, a positive notion that each of these lots in Stonegate that provided a large amount of tax money to Cape Elizabeth, they were allowed a certain area of a building lot within their whole acreage. I have an acre and a half, and I was only allowed, I mean, I bought mine as a spec house type of thing, but I was told you cannot cut one tree beyond there, even though that you own that property between there and there. Okay, and I said, why? Well, because it has to be approved by the town or it's against the rules. You cannot touch it. Recently, um, Mr. Pillsbury went ahead and sold a uh, property around the corner from us, the, the first house on the right on Stonegate. And I talked to her the other day, and she said, you know, he told us distinctly, I said, we have no back, hardly backyard, but we are not allowed to cut any of these trees because it's all being protected. Okay, for me, that is, he is very well aware of how the natural setting in Stonegate is so important. Um, another part is that also I've noticed that 
he went ahead and tonight, for some reason, the one other stone, he's had for sale signs, two of them up for two properties. So as if he did have the right to go ahead and build that and enter onto Stonegate. And that's been very disturbing um, that we didn't know anything about this. But so I went ahead and went on my computer tonight, today, to just go ahead and have something to look at. And I'm going, yeah, that's exactly what I was told too when I was coming into Stonegate. Um, there's an area in here in one of our, in a part of the declarations of the subdivision where nothing can be um, built or destroyed like 50 feet from some common areas. A big part of it is, is that um, in one of these articles it says that no trees in excess of 8 inches caliper. Now does that mean around? eight inches around, it's not diameter, right? Eight inches around, can be cut within 15. I, I believe that's diameter. No, it's caliper must mean around, like a perimeter. Cal calipers. Does anybody know the difference diameter. between diameter and a caliper? Caliper is a measure of device, a measure of diameter. Okay, eight inches would be how big of a tree? That's all part of the covenant, so, right? Yeah. No, well, this is, this is what, we can't do this. And I'm telling you, it says there. Is that in the covenants? This is our declaration, but this is important because I want to tell, tell you this is that here and it says that we can't cut within 15 feet of another lot or 50, 30 feet from any street line. We cannot remove any trees whatsoever. Okay? And in the next paragraph, it says in Article 5, it says that all of these provisions. I think it shall not be amended without the approval of Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. That means that all these areas around each one of our homes is protected by you. And like I can't cut a tree down because you're protecting it from them, for them. It's like you're there for our protection. And when property, I want to know is another thing is when you're talking about it being a public road, to me that's not black and white. It's a public road with a footnote because I want to know is where does Stonegate begin and where does it end? Um, it clearly in the front of the entrance where Stonegate Road begins, that shows that that is all of going to be Stonegate, okay? Not saying that somebody from here from the property over there can go ahead and say, you know, I bet I can sell this property for a little bit more if I cut the driveway this way. Where there has always been a driveway to that side, that property there has always been an opening to his chain link fence. There has always been an opening there and he also uses that opening. So I just want to see that you protect us as property owners and that when we went there, there was a 20 years ago when this subdivision was, I don't know how many subdivisions there were in Cape Elizabeth at that time. And I also noted on the last town meeting on the agenda that I didn't actually stay for because it ended so, it was so late. But it did say there was something about open space, that they want to keep free space in Cape Elizabeth. And how is this keeping free space if one person has a lot and decides to divided into three building lots. Now how is that keeping into any open space and the protection of the future of what Cape Elizabeth looks like unless it's, you know, part of some kind of protected area? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And please don't sell your home tomorrow, like you said I'm you wanted to. No, please don't sell your home tomorrow. That was, you said that early on. Well, we no, it's we like I haven't want you stood up in front of podium. You know, <coughs> I've been a president to a quilters guild, but I haven't stood up in front of anybody in a long time. So. We don't want you to leave. Uh, it's my assumption that the restrictions on trees of certain size being cut is part of the subdivision requirements. And uh, that doesn't apply to townwide unless you're in a setback, a shoreland uh, 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 protection zone or, or a buffer around a, a RP1 or RP2 I mean, water body. I don't have any problem with me cutting all those trees down by the key belt now by my house. No, uh, Can I do that now? 
my, no, no, don't, don't. I mean, I go true. ahead and when, when, you know, a tree has been taken down by a storm, I'm out there with my little chainsaw protecting it so that people can run past it through my uh, back of my yard. And sometimes, you know, they run up Jolly John's driveway too because they get lost back there, but I keep on telling them it's over that way. The exit's that way. Right. Now, I'd love to be able to cut some of those crummy looking trees down. So I don't have to ask you permission anymore. I'll just tell my neighbors that we don't have to worry about it anymore. We can cut those trees down. Because I thought that town... No, we're, we're talking, don't, don't misconstrue what I said. The, the, that is town property. And, and the, so the only point property? I'd like to make yeah. is that as we, def, as we defined earlier, uh, uh, th there's a right to put in a driveway to access your lot. But you uh, don't have to go ahead and strip all the natural I vegetation. think that's a totally different issue and, and as an aside opinion I tend to agree but with you. you. I don't know the there. circumstances. You should have been there to protect us when it came to any of that stripping of any of that <coughs> those trees because all those trees in that neighborhood are protected if they are on the areas which is belongs to the town, which is the green belt and the areas alongside the road. We're, we're only addressing one issue, and that's the permit and the driveway across that, that stone but gate already entrance cut, to get he's through the lot. Cut, he's already cut. We're not addressing all the other trees being cut down, and that's not our position tonight. All right, so you know, in the future, can you take any position to cutting trees down on property that's well, that, that's on not my the, lot? Well, that's not, that's not under the jurisdiction of the Zoning Board of Appeals to address tree removal. We're only, our so only I one goal cut, tonight is cut, a permit. So I can cut my trees in, in the backyard now? It's on my property, but I was told that the town would not allow me to cut any trees. The, we have established that trees may be removed to provide space for a driveway for access to a property. That's all we're talking about. We're not talking about anything else to allow a building permit to be Well, that issued. tree, uh, the trees over there and the trees by the green belt that are on my property, um, to me that's the same type of trees. But that's not the issue tonight. It's the building permit. Was the building permit issued properly? Well, I tell you, this whole thing was so secretive, hardly any of us knew that this was a going along on so that we couldn't even put in an appeal in the beginning. And that's what's really wrong here in this town. It's pretty secretive. It's all building permits are posted on the, on the uh, net. And they stay well, what if somebody has gone because of an illness in a family and they have to you go have on to state? You have to talk to the council about another notification. We do what best we can as far as notification. If there's another way to do it and you feel, uh, uh, you feel like there should be another way, then... Quickly. Excuse me? Uh, this all happened very, very quickly. Thank you for your comment. Hello, my name is Patricia Brigham and I live at 34 Rockcrest Drive and I'd first like to thank you all for your service to the community and I guess step back, I'm not an attorney. Um, and it seems a couple, having sat through probably cumulatively now six or seven hours on this one particular topic, um, I guess I would appeal to you separately, no pun intended, to maybe review and improve how this situation situations like this. I think this is a very unique situation, but how these can be resolved. The town, I attended the town council meeting and the appeal that you referred to earlier. They adjourned and requested that we get additional information. They did sort of the same thing you're doing, um, which is fine, and I understand you have to make decisions on legal points, but a couple things come to mind, and I still haven't had any clarification from you. The residency should have been established before the subdivision was created. That, to me, would negate any decisions and put everything on hold. I still haven't had that clarified. Um, it is a change in an entrance. I don't think anyone would debate that. Your, the town attorney representing you said there's no case law to support it, but I think if, you, if it happened in your neighborhood, and I think you alluded to that, 
That is a change in the appearance to the subdivision. I think all that the neighborhood is asking for was a fair shake and a seat at the table. We did not get that. We got no notification at all that it was changing or happening. I think someone even said if the driveway went on Mitchell Road, we probably would have been home by now. The town council wouldn't have spent three or four hours on this topic. We were never asked. We're not unreasonable. We weren't communicated with. And I don't think we want it both ways because, in fact, what I've learned is we've been paying with private money to maintain town-owned property that abuts the street. Um, I think also what is, I think we need to review the process, but the other thing that was brought up tonight is the property is very clearly being marketed as Stonegate property. The driveway and the parcels could have been accessed by Mitchell Road. There was a very conscious decision not to do that and for them to be marketed by Stonegate. I would argue that if you're marketing it like that, that becomes part of Stonegate. Again, we're reasonable people. All we want to do is have a conversation. If these are Stonegate properties, they should be subject to the covenants in Stonegate. That's a separate, that's not even a legal issue. That's just sort of, we live in a small town. We're all neighbors. We need to work together. So however you decide or don't decide this appeal, I would appeal to the town that somebody or all of you sit together, the town council, the planning board, you're all reasonable people. We need to all talk, and that's not what happened this time around. So again, thank you. I know you've spent a lot of time. That would be my request. Thank you for your comments. I'm, I'm not sure that we're doing this. I uh, keep referring back to give me something concrete to where the building permit should not have been issued. I'm, I'm not doing that at all. Uh, I don't think our board intends to do that at all. We are here just to determine whether the building permit was issued appropriately or not. Well, I sort of got the impression that from the town council they were saying, well, should there have been a driveway there? Is it a driveway issue or a building permit issue? So it was a little bit unclear to those of us sitting in the audience that the two of them hadn't even talked, or they talked, and one decision was already made, so that the two decisions didn't feed an intro block. That was the impression that we got in the audience. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daryl Nagel, and I live at 35 Rockhurst Drive. Um, I obviously utilize that entrance in and out every day, many times. And I'm not going to get into articles and subdivision and all the legal terms. Completely disappointed, completely disappointed that our entrance has been ruined. It is absolutely ruined. I also was very embarrassed entertaining this holiday season when two guests separately arrived. And as soon as they entered our home, said, what is that at the beginning of the entrance? I said, thank you. That is what's happened here. Our town, planning board, whoever, has destroyed what we've all worked really hard for. We moved here 15 years ago from a beautiful area in New Jersey. We searched and searched for a place to build a home to raise a family, and we did. And here we are now. The boys are getting older. Eventually, we'd like to sell. Do you think, in, particularly now in this economy, trying to sell a home is difficult enough, but to now destroy what you enter into Stonegate? I sent an email out when we first found out about this, saying I was told it's not in Stonegate. Well, excuse me, if you've come through the gates that we maintain with our personal funds, and I've been on the design and I've actually installed things myself in Stonegate to see them ruined, to see that there was just no consideration for what we pay in our taxes and the pride in the homeownership that we have within Stonegate. It is a real smack in the face to see something like this happen. Now, if in fact it's all legal and it's all fine and it's all okay, Somebody should have stepped up to the plate and said, hey, wait, guys, at least build a home that conforms to the other homes in Stonegate. Whether or not they ever join our association, which I firmly believe they should, whether or not they pay their dues and become part of the Stonegate Association, that's another piece. But for God's sakes, don't put up a house that doesn't even fit. Now, I'm not saying that house is not going to be a nice house, 
but there are certain guidelines when you build in Stonegate that you have to follow. We had a beautiful contemporary home in New Jersey. We live in the end of the cul-de-sac in Rockcrest Drive. We initially thought, wow, maybe we should rebuild this contemporary home. That would have never been approved because when we built, your plans had to be approved by the association. So now we have this home going up that does not conform in any way, shape, or form to what we have all invested in. And again, that's a smack in the face. Who knows? Who can promise? Can any one of you promise me that the person who buys that house will take really great honor in owning it and put in beautiful landscaping and maintain it and not leave things thrown out on the front lawn? You can't guarantee me that. We're not allowed to have RVs. We're not allowed to store, I don't know, extra cars, whatever. But they're going to be able to because they have no covenants to follow. So when people come into Stonegate, they are going to be the welcome committee. Should be absolutely ashamed of themselves to construct something like that. Had they left the, the buffer up and set the house in, I'm sure there was a way that they could have made a driveway come off of Mitchell Road. We just had a situation last year or the year before. Time's going by so fast, I really can't say for sure what, which, which it was. Regardless, we had some landscaping we had to redo, and it was to the, to abutted the yard of the house that when you come, in, come out of Stonegate at that entrance, is on your left-hand side. That house faces Mitchell Road as well as the driveway. When we, all is said and done, it's perfectly fine now. You still feel like you're entering Stonegate. You still have our path. Well, that's been ruined on the other side now. It's been cleared. What are we supposed to do now? What, what kind of control? There is no control now. What, what if somebody moves into that house and really just blatantly doesn't care and just leaves things astray, thrown around? Is that okay? We pay pretty good taxes in Stonegate, and I don't think anybody's ever refused a, a check of mine that I've dropped off. No one's ever said, hold on to that, Mrs. Nagel. You don't need to give us that much. There's a reason we pay those taxes. Are you going to come now and say, we're going to reduce your taxes because we wrecked your entrance? Of course you're not. You're going to continue to raise them. I feel that somebody needs to be behind us on this. I think it's really, really unfair. Really unfair for the money that we've all invested and the time. But no one could take a hard look at this and say, wait a minute, guys. What do you think they're going to say? Just go ahead. Do whatever you want. But everywhere else in town, everything's protected. You can't do anything. It amazes me that the conservation committee, and then this, we can't build here, we can't build there. But did the audacity to do that to our entrance? I'm extremely disappointed, and I certainly hope there's a way that this can be resolved. I know you have better things to do with your time at 940, as I do. And again, I use this day in and day out. And when I have people coming into my home from out of town making comments, that's really the reason I'm here now, because now I've had it. I don't want to hear negative things about Stonegate now when we've invested way too much already. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. They're quite compelling. Uh, there are three aside issues that I see here that have been brought up, and I'd like these to be mentioned for the record. And that is, it, it was identified early, and, and these are just questions in my mind, none of which unfortunately apply to the case before us tonight. But I think they're very very, there, there are points that have been brought up. Why were more trees than necessary to create a drive removed, or vegetation, or uh, whatever? Second is, if these properties, why are these properties being marketed as Stonegate property? And third, why was a driveway put off of Stonegate Road and not Mitchell Road? I think those are three questions that have come to that have been brought up, I think they're valid questions. If I were a homeowner, I would ask those three questions. 
we do not have jurisdiction over any of those tonight because that is not at issue. The issue is one singular item, and that is, was a building permit issued correctly or incorrectly? I, if these items that I just mentioned, the three, could be other points, uh, and that's all I can say. And I hope you understand the limits of our jurisdiction and the zoning board. As I said earlier, we're on your side. We want to support you. We need legal basis to do that. And that's what we have spent quite some time trying to explore all those legal avenues. Next, please. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to be brief. I'm Thomas Brigham, also residing at 34 Rock Cross Drive, just here to express my support for the uh, appeals process. And I would just ask you to try to step back. I know that you have to follow statutes and regulations regulations and everything, but also I think there needs to be an element of common sense. As people have said, you turn onto Stonegate Road, you drive past a sign that says this is the Stonegate neighborhood. These properties are being positioned to be part of the Stonegate subdivision. They look like they're part of the Stonegate subdivision. They ought to be treated that way. They were not part of the original subdivision plan, so they should be looked at as if they're an amendment to that plan, whether they are technically in that or not. Common sense, I think, would say you need to look at this. It seems to me if you're going to claim it as Stonegate and then not be Stonegate, there's a serious question of ethics involved here. And I think we just should consider that, and that should have been considered prior to issuing a building permit. And I don't know what you do after the fact, but it seems to me that you need to look at this with a strong degree of common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments in favor? of the administrative appeal. Seeing none, are there any comments in opposition to the administrative appeal? Hello, my name is Tom Auger. I live at 388. Excuse me just a minute. Uh, I'd like to call a five-minute adjournment. No more than five minutes, please, if we could. Thank you.
Order, please. Thank you. Thank you for the interruption. No problem. I apologize. Not on the air yet. Somebody, somebody knock on that door back there and tell them, please. Or well, maybe we are. No, we're on. It says we're on. We're okay. Yeah, we're on. We're on. No, sir. Okay. Thanks. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Tom Auger. I live at 388 Mitchell Road. I'm on the corner of Mitchell and Stonegate. I'm the house directly opposite the new house being built. My backyard faces that house directly. I've heard a lot being said tonight about the buffer that these guys ripped down. Um, in other words, the town land that had the natural vegetation on it. I had one of those up to three years ago. We're in the entire length of my yard, all 200 feet down the length of Stonegate. Um, and the Stonegate had what they maintained. Then there was this buffer that was 20 feet wide, 8 feet high during the summertime. Absolutely isolated my yard. I was approached by a person from Stonegate asking if they could cut out the bittersweet, selectively cut out the bittersweet. And after we talk, talked for a few minutes, um, I said, as long as it's a bittersweet, no problem, I don't want my buffer gone. Well, I went to work, came back a week later, they'd run a bulldozer down along the length of my yard, totally wiping out that buffer. So my question is, how can that buffer have no meaning, yet the buffer across the street seems to be very important today? Doesn't make any sense to me. Did they give you a reason as to why? No, no, they acted like they were really surprised that they came in with a bulldozer. We had a discussion, you know, I was very angry about that. I called the police and filed a police report. Um, to be a good neighbor, you know, I talked to them, I, I said, well, I'm just going to put up a stockade fence. They made a big deal about that. They said they wanted it to be left natural. Being a good neighbor, I said, okay, okay I'll buy some trees, which I did. They said they'd buy some trees. I spent about a thousand bucks on about three hemlocks, three, uh, Birch trees, I put in four um, lilac bushes, I put in some blueberry bushes. I've been trying to fill it back in, but I'll never get that buffer back. I had an awesome buffer there. Um, they said they'd put some trees in. What they did, they put in some little scrub bushes about that high. You know, about 15 of them, not helping the buffer whatsoever. Uh, they told me they were going to mulch it. Well, that was left like that for two years. That was finally grass this year. So it looked like I had a strip mine beside my house for two years. So again, I ask the question, how can they have it both ways? And how can the buffer across the street be so important, yet my buffer means nothing? And you're stating that was on the Stonegate property where the buffer... The, no, it was on town land. Town, town land, land but, right but part of this... Yeah, yeah, I mean, they were taken care of on, on each side. They take care of about 10 or 15 feet. And when they were in the bulldozer, the bulldozer came in about 35 feet, cut across my lawn, cut up some of my lawn, never repaired. Evidently, that doesn't really count in this case. And they never explained why they no. were removing. Okay. No. Thank, thank you for your comment. Thank you. Um, I'm Rachel Stemiashkin. I live at Five Granite Ridge Road in Stonegate. And um, I am the person that Tom referred to. And I'd like to say that we knocked on his door to ask if we could clear the bittersweet because it was invading, climbing up the trees, and killing the trees that have been part of that Stonegate buffer. And Tom thought that that was fine. And we hired a contractor who came in, and he did come in with a bulldozer, which was a little surprising. Uh, he had in, encroached on Tom's property for about two feet uh, long and about one foot wide. And we did uh, work with Tom together to replant. And uh, we spent uh, more than $2,000 on those replantings. We couldn't afford any more. We had already depleted our funds. So it wasn't until the next year that we mulched. And we planted with many rhododendron plants. We planted with eight-foot-high hemlocks. We all donated lilacs into that area. So I would like to uh, make that record. As far as the, um, some of them, we, we worked together on, we worked together on some of those. Um, we, um, in terms of the, um, you asked for something substantive about the building permit. And the one thing that I heard tonight that was substantive, uh, I heard two things that were substantive. The first thing about the building permit was that 
it seems that building permits are not supposed to be issued on subdivided properties before going to the uh, planning board if there are three properties that constitute a subdivision. There are actually deeds recorded for each of those three properties. Now I understand that we have talked about it and maybe one of them would be rescinded, but it seems to me that the, that the building permit shouldn't have been issued without having those three properties uh, and the legality of them be substantiated prior to the building permit being issued. So that's one point I'd like to make. The other point I'd like to make, which is the same as uh, many people have made, is that I think that the changes that have happened at the entrance with the two new, the two new lots and the driveways and the trees that were cut down, there were trees cut down, I can attest to that, I can't say how many, but it does constitute a change to our subdivision. The road, the entranceway, and the buffer were all approved as part of the subdivision. And we would ask that this be sent to the planning board as a subdivision change. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Mr. Smith, would you respond to her first comment, or the first point, that uh, regarding issuing a building permit on subdivided lots? She made a definitive statement there. That well, I've subdivided. I've gone on record stating that, that if, if we find that, that he didn't meet the, the standards, we don't know that, then that will go to the planning board. That's, there's no question. But what, how does that play into the fact that a building permit was the, issued? The building permit could still issue uh, regardless of whether uh, there's a subdivision that has to go before the planning board or not. Uh, the, the attorney has already gone record uh, stating that fact. And if she could comment more. Yes. Uh, the fact that um, there might be an issue with the third lot doesn't preclude the issuance of a building permit on one lot because there isn't, isn't a right to, um, to um, establish one lot. Um, and until we get to the point of the uh, request for an issuance of, the build, of a building permit in the third lot, there really isn't an issue to be addressed. Um, yes, the deeds may have been signed, but at this point, there's only one lot for which a building permit has been requested, and the owner had a right to cut off one lot. Um, the ultimate configuration, depending on what uh, Mr. Smith's investigation determines, um, uh, ultimately may be that this is just two lots, um, or uh, the may be satisfied that the um, requirements have been met to meet the exemption under the statute and create three lots that don't require subdivision approval. But there is a right to create, um, to build on the one lot, um, and that doesn't trigger any kind of other issue. Um, and I believe there is case law to that effect, that uh, you don't have a, an issue until you get to um, a request to be building on the additional lot. So if, if the third lot is deemed to be invalid, if that's a proper term for a lot, uh, not a legal lot of record, that has no bearing on the, the existing building permit that's issued. That's correct. Thank you. Comments in opposition to the appeal? My name is David Lorry. I reside at 189 Spurwink Avenue in Cape Elizabeth. I'm an attorney, and I'm here tonight representing Early Bird Group. That's Steve Richards and Rescue Pillsbury, who are over there. And uh, they may speak afterwards, and they're certainly here to answer your questions, if you have any. Uh, the degree of cutting was overstated. I think they'll, they'll make that clear to you if, you if you want to hear from them. It's been a late night, so I'm going to try and be brief, briefer than I had intended originally. Um, 
There may have been six to eight trees taken out, actual trees. Most of what was taken out was bittersweet and other stuff, which is, although natural, was invasive and should be removed. Um, a lot of interesting discussion about buffers. You know, when, when I go to a planning board and I hear about buffers, the buffers that they're interested in are actually those that protect the neighboring properties from development. Um, Mr. Wavkonish lived on this property for about 35 years. Uh, he's in Thailand right now, so he's not available to answer your questions or even to give an affidavit. Um, he, uh, we, did con we did manage to contact him through his lawyer, or we didn't talk to him directly, but we did get something through his lawyer about his residency. Uh, he says that he continued to live there until September 30th, 2010. Uh, that's when he packed up his wife and family and, and, and they vacated the residence for the first time. He never actually lived in Florida in 2009. He bought property down there and he didn't move there until 2010. Okay, so uh, we'll get, you know, at the proper time when we need it in order for a third permit to issue uh, we will supply an affidavit or something else which substantiates uh, what he has told us. Uh, you know, he says he's never lived in Florida. He says, uh, after purchasing the Sarasota property to avoid any state law conflicts, I withdrew my Cape Elizabeth homestead exemption, but I never resided in Florida until my arrival in October 2010. And that's consistent with what his lawyer also told me, so... Um, I, I believe it, and hopefully when the time comes, and that's not tonight, uh, the town will accept that. The fact is, Mr. Welfkonish, when he lived there, I used to cross-country ski through the back there. Maybe a lot of you did before Stonegate was built. And Mr. Welfkonish had a nice wooded lot, completely private, before they put a road in next to his property, okay? And not only did open up his property, I mean, open it up in a negative sense, uh, it put a major intersection very close to even his existing driveway. Uh, certainly there's no sight distance. You could not put a driveway in uh, to this lot, to the, the lot we're talking about tonight. You could not put a driveway in from Mitchell Road, a separate driveway. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what uh, the, uh, uh, the neighbors say that they're sure that it can be done, but we can't see how it can be done without completely destroying the existing Wapkonish residence, the old Wapkonish residence, I should say. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you'd have to, put a you have to put a driveway in off of the existing driveway, and it would have to run parallel to Mitchell Road over all of the nice landscaping and around and loop around back probably because uh, part of what's already been built is in the wrong place. We would have to loop around. We have to get permission from the town to have it loop across the, uh, uh, the town land. This is town land. This, this road is town land. It is not a right-of-way. You know, reference to right-of-way is just, just improper because that's an easement. The, act, the town owns this land. There are a lot of times municipalities don't own roads. I don't know if you know that. By, before 1975, most roads were just easements. They were not in fee. This is a fee road. Uh, town owns it, has a right to control it. Mr. Wafkonish had a reasonable expectation long before these people bought their homes in Stonegate. Mr. Wafkonish had a reasonable expectation that he could connect to this new road. He could put driveways across to it and divide his lot up. And, and I don't know uh, why their expectations are any greater or any, or, uh, you know, or more, because they're here. Morf Konish is in Thailand, maybe. Uh, cause, so he can't tell you what he felt and when this happened originally and what he felt and what he would feel now. Uh, that he's being told he can't connect to this public road. Um, another thing, uh, the, uh, the code officer read out a portion of the declaration which exempts the roads from the 
covenants and the restrictions in Stonegate. And that's absolutely right. Uh, the, it's interesting, you know, we heard this stuff about the deeds. The deeds in the package that Mr. Steer sent to the town council, actually, one of them is, uh, says that the conveyance to the town is subject to the restrictions. The other one does not. The other one merely references the restrictions. And even, if, not the restrictions, the declaration, I should say. And even if you get past that issue of which deed controls, and I think that the second deed, I think that the deed, they've sort of blurred the two. They put them together. They're reading you part of the deed, which uh, talks about their right to go in and maintain the stone gates. And uh, they're not, uh, and, and it's in fact in the other deed where it says it's subject to the restrictions uh, in the declaration. So they've sort of merged the two of them, neither of which actually applies if you read the declaration itself, because the declaration exempts the roads. So, and that's the, that's the legal argument, which isn't much of a legal argument to be very candid. And those of you who know anything about deed restrictions know that they're read restrictively. The courts do not search for the intent. If it's not clearly restricted, if there isn't a clear restriction, there is no restriction. There has to be, they read these things narrowly in favor of the use of property. And uh, that, that's the rule. Um, as I said before, the buffer is usually to protect the neighborhood from the development, not the development from the neighborhood, which is what's being argued here. Uh, let's see, what else? Yeah. Um, oh, yes. Uh, the important thing for you to focus on is the fact that this is an appeal. The code enforcement officer, uh, you, don't, you don't reverse because the code enforcement officer didn't get all of the information that after the fact the opponents say he should have got before he made his decision. You deal with whether the Appellants who have the burden of proof here have established, for example, established the fact that Mr. Um, Wolf-Konish was not a resident for five years. It's their burden of proof to show that he was not, that this was not his principal residence for five years. The letter, uh, sorry, the change uh, in his uh, resident status, or his homestead exemption, I should say, the change in his homestead exemption in 2009, is only a piece of evidence. It doesn't show that he, in fact, gave up his residence at all. Uh, they have not been able to say that he moved from that home. He didn't live there until 2010, which is what I've told you, uh, is, and which is in his letter. I'll give you his letter for what it's worth. As I said before, it's not an affidavit form. He couldn't do an affidavit from Thailand. I was lucky to get this fax to me, uh, but I will give it to you. It's dated December 24th. I'll read it for the record here. It's my understanding that inquiries have been made about my residency in Cape Elizabeth. In that regard, please note that I lived at 30, 370 Mitchell Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, as my principal residence from August 4, 1972 to September 30, 2010. The day that my wife and I, with our two children, vacated the residence and squeezed literally into a fully loaded Honda van with hard shell car top carrier mounted on the roof rack and headed for Sarasota, Florida, where we had purchased a property in the summer of 2009. After purchasing the Sarasota property to avoid any state law conflicts, I withdrew my Cape Elizabeth homestead exemption, but I never resided in Florida until my arrival in, August, in October 2010. In creating two additional lots for my Cape Elizabeth residence, I worked closely with town officials and took only steps that have been reviewed by the town. Thank you for your attention. Peter I. Wolf Konish, December 24, 2010. Um, copies for the board and copies for anybody else who wants them.
So uh, the fact that he changed his uh, homestead is certainly not conclusive, uh, and it's really, as I said before, it's rebutted by this letter. Uh, you're an administrative agency. You can accept hearsay for what it's worth. Uh, and uh, the fact is that uh, the fact is that they have not proved, and it's the burden of proof of the of the appellants to prove to your satisfaction that in fact Peter Wolf Konesh was not a resident for five years. Uh, maintain this as his principal residence for the five years immediately preceding uh, his uh, attempt to divide the property. Um, I don't want, it's getting late, so I don't want to take up any more of your time. Uh, if you have questions for me, here I am. I'll sit down, you can call me back up again. Otherwise, I believe Mr. Pillsbury has something to say, and perhaps Mr. Richards as well. I, I have one question. You made the statement that a driveway could not be put in off of Mitchell Road for that lot. Is that due to site dis distance restrictions? Yes, I've, I've talked to Bob Malley about it. You could not put a, another driveway in between the existing driveway to the Wafkonish, to the old Wafkonish residence and the Stonegate Road, Stonegate Gate I, Access. You could not put another one along there. Uh, Mr. Steer and I have talked about this. He says that they could have a uh, shared driveway coming in, and legally, that probably is possible legally. It's just not physically possible. From our standpoint, it's not feasible, I'll put it that way, because we destroy the value uh, of the Wealth Konish lot and, uh, and, and, uh, and make it very difficult, uh, considering how the present construction is already, already positioned, the garage and the house. Thank you. That answered my question. Thank you. If I, if I may just clarify one point, um, uh, Charles K. Gale, which is uh, Walt Wilkinish's attorney, and I, is he present here today? Okay. He, he specifically, uh, I had correspondence with an email, and I laid out the, the, the state law that it had to be a single family dwelling that he, was, that he called, that it was his principal residence five years before the second dividing. Um, so he had that knowledge when he proceeded forth with the split of the lot, so he didn't go into it blind. So he didn't what? That. He didn't what? He didn't go into it blind. He he was he knew what the, the turn the, the, he knew what the, the law stated, and he he did that split based on the factual knowledge that he had to reside in that as a principal residence five years prior to the second divide. And so the attorney that you <coughs> referenced just now represented Mr. Wabkanish. Yes. Was representing. Mr. Wild Connors. Is that? I, okay. I assume so. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Rusty Pillsbury. I live at uh, 76 Two Lights Road, and uh, I'm actually half or part owner of Early Bird Group with uh, Steve Richard, my business partner here. Um, what I'd like to do is, and I'm going to be very short. I was actually going to take quite a bit of time. I'm going to be short because we all want to go home. Um, I just want to clear up a lot of points that were brought up tonight. I just want to make sure they're clear because I, I, I think a little bit of them were uh, misleading. Uh, when Hugh Campo was up here, he said that the, both lots had been cleared, totally cleared. We barely pulled any shrubs or trees off the first lot, the one that's currently being constructed. The second lot, we haven't even touched. We've taken some trees out of the buffer, the so-called buffer, that, that town area that we've taken some trees out at the instruction of Bob Maui. Our lots we have not cleared, but as Bruce said, we could clear them if we wanted to, but we haven't. We reserve, we want, they've been landscaped for 38 years by Mr. Wolf Cornish, and they fit beautifully with homes. They're going to be, they're going to be beautiful. Um, the buffer, we did not completely clean out the buffer. We took approximately six to eight trees down. The six to eight trees we did take down were being choked out by the bittersweet, which Rachel herself said bittersweet does choke out the trees, just like across the street on Tom's property. The bittersweet choked out the trees. Bob Malley can, can um, vouch for us. He specifically pointed out which trees need to come down. We need to take out certain trees to get the underground utilities, the water, the sewer, the driveways. The majority of it was bittersweet. 
It was a jungle of bittersweet with a few beer cans in there and some trash bags. We cleaned it up. We're not done yet. We're not done. We're, we're, we're just at the beginning, beginning stages. We pride ourselves on our properties, on the, on the quality of our properties, the way they blend into the neighborhood. We've built several homes around Cape Elizabeth, and, and some of you may, may know the homes. We're proud of this. We're not done yet. We're not done landscaping. We're not done with the driveways yet. It will look just fine. Um, it's almost offensive to say that these designs are, are uh, inferior. Um, the opponents claim that this, this house will affect their, the, the Stonegate neighborhood. I'm a state certified residential appraiser. I have been for 25 years. Um, I can't imagine any appraiser coming up with the same conclusion as they, that these houses will draw down the value of their neighborhood. Um, we've made several attempts to, become, to come to a compromise with the association. Um, the association, I believe, is just being unreasonable. We've, um, we, we've, we've offered many of things, landscaping, all sorts of things, uh, and they're just being unreasonable. The property was for sale for two years, maybe even more than two years. It was for sale. Anyone could buy it. The association could buy it. If the association bought it, they could control it. They didn't. We did. Um, the opponents will also lead you to believe that there is a lot of people upset, and there are. Um, but for every one Stonegate owner, homeowner that is here tonight, there's three or four that are not here for one reason or another. Um, this property has never been part of Stonegate. It is not part of Stonegate. It is simply accessed via a public road, Stonegate Road, and that's it. It's, there's no, nothing more than that. So that so-called buffer will be restored. We will restore that with landscaping. We're not going to put bittersweet back because bittersweet is everyone's enemy. Nobody likes bittersweet. But we will, we will make these places presentable. And that's I have it. a quick question for you, sir. Yep. Um, we've got in our packet a a f single family agent synopsis, a multiple, it looks like a multiple, multiple listing yep. service yep. record. And for neighborhood association, it says Stonegate. And I was just wondering if you could explain or you, you know anything about this document or what is meant by that. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's <clears throat> in the MLS when it states if it's in a neighborhood, if it's in Broad Cove, if it's in uh, the West End, you know, what's the neighborhood, just so that people can reference it by the neighborhood. So it's more of a reference. Than, as an, than part of the association. Um, we've offered to join the association. They, they don't want this house in the association. They don't want this house anywhere sto associated with Stonegate Road. I, I respect that, but I, you know, that's their decision. So. Any other questions? So, and thank you very much for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. Any further comments? I'm sorry. There, there, is, there is one point I neglected to, to, to point out for you and for the Stonegate residents, that if indeed my clients are required to go through subdivision, they could actually have four lots there, okay, in a subdivision. They have enough property to get four lots if they go through the subdivision process subsequently. So this is going to all be decided on another date, uh, another forum than this forum. But uh, I just want to make sure everybody understands that, uh, in fact, if that's the end result of this, uh, they, you know, if they have to go through the cost, the time and cost of going through subdivision, they'll be asking for four lots, not three lots. Thank you. Any other comments? We will now close the floor to public comments. Uh, may I have comments from the board members, please? If any. I will make one comment, and it's uh, as I have stated several times, uh, we, the appeal that was brought before us this evening, the administrative appeal, it was our intent, whether it's stated in the rules, uh, town ordinance, or our 
job description. Uh, I always approach these in favor of the appeal person who is doing the appeal, whether it's for a variance or any other administrative appeal in this case. Uh, I like to be on the town side since I'm a town member, and that's the way I, for the years that I've been on the board, I've always felt myself as a friend to the applicant. And because uh, too many boards, I think, take the opposite view. Uh, this is a personal opinion on my point. I keep going back to trying to find a legal reason why this permit should not have been issued, and I can see no clear legal. I see every one of your points. I sympathize with you. Uh, I will, as I stated earlier, personal opinion. I wouldn't necessarily like it if this happened to my neighborhood. Uh, from a code standpoint, legal standpoint, I do not see any clear evidence why this appeal should be approved. Uh, and I hope it's understood my reasoning behind that. We can't make a legal decision of own personal opinions. We have to, we, every decision that this board makes sets legal precedents. And so we have to follow the code and the ordinances as best we can, and we attempt to do that. Uh, based on the arguments both sides, and I think I understand and grasp the, the, the situation, is that this permit for this lot, building permit, was issued properly. And that's my feeling at this time. I appreciate other board members' comment. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and explain my thinking, too. I, I've driven by through this neighborhood many times, and it's a gorgeous neighborhood. Um, and it seems like you have a great bunch of neighbors, and everybody who showed up here um, made really good points. And I certainly, um, having driven by the site, see why you're concerned about it. Um, but uh, the, the two things that, that um, go through my mind are, first, what, is, what our job here is tonight as a board, and I hope it doesn't seem like we're doing this. It may seem like we're pointing at each other and trying to pass the buck, but um, our job here is very limited. We just have to review the code enforcement officer's <clears throat> job for, for mistakes, and we have to see if we can find a mistake that he made. And um, regarding the subdivision issue, um, it seems to me that the code enforcement officer did a reasonable investigation. He asked around. He consulted town records. He confirmed that Mr. Wavkanish lived in this uh, lot on Mitchell Road for <clears throat> since the 70s before uh, dividing it into two additional lots. So um, that seems like a reasonable um, amount of evidence to me to conclude that, that it was proper to divide these lots without going to the planning board. On the, um, the sort of the uh, buffer issue, um, I, think, I think where the disconnect is is um, looking at reality versus sort of practical reality versus what is legal reality. And um, what, what the ordinance tells us to do is consult the subdivision plan, not the subdivision as it may have existed or developed over the years. And when I look at the subdivision plan, I see that the Wovkanish lot is not in the plan, so it's not part of the subdivision. It may feel that way, but it, it is not part of the subdivision. And when I look at the, you know, the half-acre buffer that you all are referring to, <clears throat> the subdivision plan doesn't refer to any landscaping, any easement, or anything like that. It just looks like a road to me, a, a strangely shaped road, uh, granted, but it still looks like a road. The, the subdivision plan does not restrict or suggest that it should be reserved for landscaping. Um, when, I, when I drove to the site uh, today, I, I saw that this, the, you know, the signs and the stone walls that are referenced in the um, in the um, subdivision's covenants 
are still there and the landscaping is still there. It looks to me like what happened was the, not some natural vegetation was removed. It's, it's not even clear to me that that, that violates um, the covenants. But, but to me, the, you know, the important point is that when I compare this, this plan <clears throat> to what's being done there, I don't see any changes to it. The, the road is still there in the exact same place. Now they're adding a driveway. Um, I suppose you could argue that adding a driveway to a road in a subdivision is a change to the plan, but I personally don't think that that would be the stronger argument. I, I think that, um, that if, if the, the developer had intended um, the subdivision to include that, that lot and that portion, he should have bought the property or he should have um, changed the plan to indicate it. He could have very easily illustrated stone walls, um, landscaping easements, walking easements on the subdivision plan, and he chose not to do that. And unfortunately, um, that document that was, was prepared by him years ago is, is what we have to look at. Um, so that, you know, that's my thinking on it. I, um, you know, I hope it makes sense to you all. I, I know you've, you've all made really good points here. And um, actually, I, the final thing I want to address is, uh, sort of the driveway issue, um, the, the code enforcement officer was presented with a valid driveway permit issued by Public Works. There are a lot of factors in deciding how this driveway should go in that we just aren't equipped or aren't allowed to consider. Um, it, it seems proper that Public Works should issue that document and hopefully um, you, know, you all are allowed to have input into whether that conflicts with your buffer in that forum, um, but, but having received that document with the application process, uh, it seems to me that the, the code enforcement officer was acting properly and relying on that decision and not having to rethink where the driveway should go and um, that he could, he could rely on the driveway going um, onto Stonegate Road. So that's my thinking on the, on the issue. Peter, I don't, I don't, you didn't leave a whole lot for anybody else to say. Um, you know, essentially, I think the bottom line is that the permits issued, uh, you have, the applicant hasn't convinced me uh, that a subdivision was created. Uh, and I'm also not convinced that the concept of a driveway to a public road uh, rises to the point where it would require a planning board review. Um, so I, I'm going to have to say that the permit was properly issued. Well, as, uh, as you said, Peter, there's not a lot more I can say. Uh, having been uh, through this uh, with the town uh, personally, I can appreciate uh, the Stonegate uh, folks and what, they, uh, what they're feeling tonight. And uh, some of my questions may have uh, indicated that I was uh, attempting to justify, but really I was looking for an opportunity or a door to be open that would say, ah, they do have a case. And I don't believe that that has occurred here tonight. I have to go by what the evidence is provided, uh, and I believe the permit was issued appropriately. I don't believe the subdivision uh, statute was violated by the two uh, driveways. Uh, as much as I'd like to uh, side with the Stonegate folks, I, I don't believe I'm going to be able to tonight. Thank you. May I have a motion, please? Uh, a motion in the affirmative. Uh, I believe we should probably make three motions. I'll make the first motion that the first point, which I believe uh, Bruce said whether the permit should be issued, uh, that uh, um, uh, I would move that uh, it was issued appropriately. Point of procedure, please. Uh, any motion should be uh, uh, in the affirmative to approve or, or deny the appeal. Okay, just one motion. Right. Approve it. I would move to uh, deny the appeal. No, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. It has to be. It has to be made an affirmative to approve the uh, the appeal. 
that it has to be made to per primitive. I'm not doing a very good job here. Would one of you like to jump in? Well, let me state this. Please correct me. Please modify. We have before us uh, an administrative appeal. A motion is made to, to approve the administrative appeal of David and Tracy Weatherby of 14 Stonegate Road, tax map U50, lot 24, of the code enforcement officer's decision to approve an It's not an amendment to the, to the subdivision. To approve the issuance of a building permit, permit number 110181, issued on November 1, 2010, for a dwelling at 6 Stonegate Road, tax map U31, lot 9D, as in Delta. to approve the, since we are required to make motions in the affirmative, just so it's clear to the audience and to make sure I'm stating this properly, we have an affirmative motion to approve the appeal of David and Tracy Weatherby to, of the code enforcement's issuance of a building permit for number six Stonegate Road, meaning that if we vote yes, we are saying that the building permit was issued incorrectly. Okay. If we vote no, for clarification, point of order, that we are saying that the Weatherby appeal is improper and that the building permit was issued correctly. And that is a legal rules of procedure where motions have to be presented in the affirmative. Is that clear to all board members? So you, no, it's not. So you're telling me that we can't make a motion to deny the, the appeal? Yes. What I'm saying is that the correct, I believe the correct way of doing it is to state that having the building permit issued, that the building permit was issued incorrectly. So we cannot make a motion to deny the appeal. That's correct. Right. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. What I'm saying is the correct way to do it is to do it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't agree, but that's fine. I would make the, emo the motion to approve the administrative appeal of uh, David and uh, Tracy Weatherby, um, uh, 14 Stonegate Road, tax map. U50, uh, lot 24 of the code enforcement officer's decision to approve an amendment to the Stonegate subdivision and the issuance of a building permit, building permit number 110181, issued November 1st, 2010, for a dwelling at 6 Stonegate Road, tax map U31, lot E nine. All those in favor? All those opposed? The administrative appeal has been denied. Who, who seconded? Good choice. Sorry? Who seconded? Did we have a second to the motion? Sure. Second. Second. So Peter Black? Peter Howe. Peter Howe. So the administrative appeal was denied. The building, for interpretation purposes, we have deemed the building permit to be valid. Thank you. Now, you've, you've got to establish findings of facts before you leave. OK. So I don't know if you want to, what, uh, what do you want, Mr. Wald, to do it while you take a five minute break and, and finding a fact? And that should be stated, not voted on. Correct. And to take ten minute break. Ten minute. Okay. Ten minutes. Ten minute break. We're still in here. Or less. Ten minutes or less.
do is read proposed finding of facts, and I'd like board members to comment on these. Okay. And as you all, what I'm going to do, if you all will follow along with me, board members, uh, I'm going to read these line item. Ask for your comments and changes, and then we'll move on to the next item. Findings of fact. Number one, the current owner of 6 Stonegate Road, tax map U31, lot 9, Delta, the property is Early Bird Group LLC owner, uh, also known as owner, or referred to in this document as owner, 6 Stonegate Road being the property, as referenced later. Grand Pillsbury acts as the owner, owner's authorized member. Please stop me if there are any comments or corrections. Number two, the property is bounded on its westerly side by Mitchell Road and on its southerly side by the Stonegate Road right of way. Three, on October 28, 2010, the town's public works director approved a, approved a driveway permit connecting the property with Stonegate Road. Four, on November 1, 2010, Code Enforcement Officer Bruce Smith issued a building permit for the property, permit number 110181, for the construction of a single family resident on the property. Item five, on November 30, 2010, David and Tracy Weatherby of 14 Stonegate Road, also known as the appellants, filed an appeal of the building permit. Number six, the appellant's home is located within the Stonegate subdivision, the plan for which was recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds in three phases on June 5, 1986, September 23, 86, and November 9, 1992. I assume that all three of those refer to the appellant's home. Item seven, Stonegate residents William J. Orcutt of 18 Stonegate Road, Hugh Campbell of 24 Stonegate Road, Thomas and Patricia Brigham of 34 Rockcrest Road, and Jerry and Addie Harke of 23 Stonegate Road have submitted statements in support of this appeal claiming that the approval of the subject building permit will adverse, adversely affect their investment in, in and reliance upon the sub, Stonegate subdivision approval. Rachel Stamienskin, president of the Stone pardon me if that was incorrect, the president of the Stonegate Homeowner Association submitted a detailed statement in support of this appeal. Item 8, notice of this appeal was pro provided to the owner on, and we do not have a date for that. I assume that can be added as needed. Item 9, the following members of the Zoning Board of Appeal re recuse themselves from participation in this hearing. I'd like that to be changed to... Uh, Peter Howe identified uh, a relationship with the uh, uh, developer of the property and based on the definition of uh, did you read, what was that definition? conflict of interest, uh, it was determined that there was no conflict of interest. We added for comments from the audience and none was submitted. Item 10, the appellants contend principally, number one, that the property is part of an illegal subdivision upon which a building permit may not, may not be issued, and correction there, and two, I believe, and two, that the building permit constituted an amendment to the Stonegate subdivision, which requires planning board review. Item, yes, sir. I just, I thought they had a third argument that I, we might want to add that the building permit violates a buffer established by the Stonegate subdivision plan? I believe that was one that was supplemented here tonight, so it wasn't one that Okay. Should we yeah. add it? Yeah, okay. it's probably appropriate to make sure the alternate intentions are reflected. So you, you're recommending we add that? Yes. Okay. As noted? Yes. Number item 11, as of, 
11. As of September 10, 2010, Peter I. was Kanish was owner of the parcel of property, property located at 370 Mitchell Road, tax map U31, lot 9, Bravo, consisting of approximately two acres of land and a single family house. The property abuts the Stonegate subdivision, but was never owned by the developers of the Stonegate subdivision, nor otherwise included within the plans for this subdivision. Item 12, on September 10, 2010, Mr. Wav Kanish out conveyed to himself two parts of Lot 9 Bravo. The first out conveyance consists of approximately 47,831 square feet, contains <coughs> pardon me, 200.31 feet of frontage on Stonegate and is currently assigned a street address, 10 Stonegate Road and tax map U31, Lot 9E is an echo. The second out conveyance, which is a property at issue in this, legal, in this appeal, consists of approximately 21,938 square feet, contains 117.66 feet of frontage on Mitchell Road and 189.71 feet of frontage on Stonegate Road, and is currently assigned the street address of 6 Stonegate Road and tax map U31, Lot 9, Delta. Item 13, on September 15, 2010, Mr. Wavkanish conveyed the remainder of Lot 9 Bravo, 300, 370 Mitchell Road, to Graham S. Pillsbury, Pillsbury and Stephen H. Richard, and conveyed Lots 9 Delta, the property, and 9 Echo to Early Bird Group, LLC, of which Mr. Pillsbury and Mr. Richard are members. Item 14. I hope I'm saying that name properly. Uh, item 14, Lot 9 Echo is currently undeveloped. Item 15, Stonegate Road is a public road conveyed to Cape Elizabeth by Stonegate Associates by warranty deed dated December 5, 1989 and recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds at, at Book 9015, page 16. Stonegate Associate, Associates recited in its deed of Stonegate Road that the conveyance was subject to the Declaration of Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions. Item 16, the grant of Stonegate Road by Stonegate Associates to the town is approximately 135 feet, I assume that's feet wide, from an entrance at Mitchell Road back through an area at issue in this appeal. The paved Stonegate Road is approximately 30 feet wide with vegetation on both sides. Item 17, the driveway on the property is laid over approximately 25 feet of the property and approximately 70 feet of vegetation in the Stonegate Road right of way before connecting with the paved road. Item 18, does the board wish to provide any other findings of fact? Please come to the podium, yes. I don't know if that's appropriate for him to comment. Well, it's appropriate if, to, to, if to suggest that you can decide whether that is a finding. I, I'd suggest that you make a, an additional finding that the Declaration of Covenants contains an exception for roads in the subdivision, uh, as pointed out to you by the code officer, because I think that's important in terms of the finding 15. And, and also, as part of that addition, I'd like to reference that line item number in the covenant, whatever. Uh, Article 3. You want to know where it is? Yeah. If you have it, I'll enter Thank it you. now. Thank you. Yeah, it's the first. Uh... Yeah. Where is it? It's the second paragraph of the uh, covenants. Which is exhibit what? Do you have a page or reference number? Or? It's the first page, page, it's the first page of the covenants, page the second one. paragraph. Okay. Which, uh, which is exhibit what? Exhibit B to appellant's submission or what? Yeah, exhibit B. Is it first exhibit page. B? It's in the appellant's Okay. Uh, if we could reference that, that is a, a recorded deed, is that correct? 
Okay. If we could reference that, and that is recorded, I assume, so if we could reference that book and page number and uh, try to reference that paragraph that uh, should be entered describing the relationship or exclusion of this parcel from the subdivision covenants, jurisdiction of the subdivision covenants, if that's correct. I think you understand my intent. Are there any other items that uh, board members would, are? That would be how I would phrase it. Uh, would you like to read that? Yep. Um, for 18, the additional finding, the second paragraph of Exhibit B to appellant's submission, parentheses, declaration of covenants and restrictions, and parentheses, excludes roadways. Okay. And, and that can be further described or modified as necessary, but I think for tonight we understand the intent of that. Uh, uh, that would be finding of fact number 18. Uh, shall we, we should vote on those finding of fact, I assume, or is that not necessary? We just submit those finding of fact. Uh, all, uh, are all board members? Do they have to vote? Okay. Uh, do I, uh, finding of facts so stated, 18 finding of facts as stated, do I have a motion to uh, approve those 18 additional findings of facts that will be uh, attached to this uh, administrative appeal? So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Any other points of order? Conclusion, uh, conclusions A, B, C, and D, we uh, are not necessary to be. Yeah, I, I, and that's all I'm sure. I think your vote on the ultimate question is sufficient. Right, finding of facts. Uh, uh, additional inclusions were uh, stated in this draft findings of fact, and we are, I recommend that we uh, do not include conclusions A, B, C, and D. If there, are there any objections to that? Uh, since they're not relevant to the, the situation that we are, where we are. Um, I'm going to lean on you. If there's anything else we should include based on tonight, I'd like your recommendation. That I what? That the board as a whole had considered each of their arguments and had reached the conclusion that the evidence did not support each of their contentions. The only thing I would suggest is that you could state that each, uh, uh, basically, a, a conclusion that each of those contentions were considered or uh, viewed in light of the evidence that was submitted and were rejected. That's the only that's the other thing I'm pointing When you want to break those down as three separate items or whether you want to say that the third item. Well stated, as stated. Any comments, questions? All right. May we include that statement? Would you draft that statement that you just made? I, I will. Thank you. I, I felt yeah, I sure that you would. Yeah, I, I was up on the same issue, basically. I, I assume you're going to draft it to say that the applicant failed to meet their burden of uh, convincing the board that uh, that uh, there was a violation of the subdivision statute, that there was a violation of the uh, subdivision ordinance, et cetera. That's great. I, I am fine with that. I think that's essentially what we said. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And at 10 minutes to 11, I think it could be well stated by yourself and was well stated by yourself. And, and uh, we are all in agreement with that. Move to adjourn? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, any other issues regarding this? Comments? Thank you. Uh, this is my final meeting, and I want to take one minute to say uh, that I've enjoyed my 11 years on the Zoning Board of Appeal. Uh, I took over, this is going to be brief, believe me. I was asked to take over the unexpired term of, and I don't remember her name, she was chairman at the time, I believe, in the year 2000, it was the summer of 2000, she had to move to Washington, D.C. I was asked to fill her unexpired position. I subsequently uh, uh, completed three three-year terms, and I think the board, as overall in general, I think we've done well, or attempted to do well, and I want to thank Mr. Smith for his guidance. And uh, Ms. Weatherby, as well as all the other excellent recording secretaries, that's probably the hardest job at this is, is making all this, putting it down in writing when we talk on and on, as we tend to do. But I want to thank you for your support and, and the town for the opportunity to represent the town. And as of December 31st, I officially expire. <laughs> so many more to and I'll thank you for your service. Uh, Mr. And Chairman, on I, uh, behalf of the town, we, we, uh, the town appreciates your service. And, and you know, you only have to stay away a year. Well, <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, just one second. Uh, you're not the only one going off the board. Unfortunately, uh, I had a one-year term. Uh, they asked me if I'd be willing to run again. And, I'm moving back to Vermont at the end of 2011, and so I did not feel comfortable saying I was going to serve three years when I knew it was only going to be one more year. So unfortunately, I'll be going off the board. I've enjoyed it. I was finally getting comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to come to this meeting. Well, thanks to all the no, board. No, been enjoyable. Thank you for your service. Thank you all. A meeting is adjourned. I have a motion. Move to so move. Second. Second. Approved. Thank We're all ready to go. Can anybody start with your findings? Yeah, okay. Last meeting is chair. I mean, here.